or snap on electric lights. Electric lights? No more kerosene, no more gas. <laughs> Sarah sure gets to the core of the apple. But we do have this new wash day marvel. You know, it takes me only five hours to do the wash. Imagine, it used to take two days. <laughs> well, that's right, folks. Now Sarah has time for other things like, like canning uh, and cleaning the oven. And yes, the dear. The ovens don't just clean themselves. You know. I know, dear. <laughs> and they probably never will. Now, excuse me, I have to get the laundry off the line before it starts raining cats and dogs. <laughs> Welcome to For Your Amusement, a theme park podcast that aims to exhaustively evaluate the world's most popular theme park attractions to determine if they are world class. I'm Ryan Bergara. I'm Byron Marin. And for this episode's featured attraction, we grapple with the idea of a great big beautiful tomorrow in this cold, scary world of today to discuss the Carousel of Progress in the Magic Kingdom in Walt Disney World, Orlando, Florida. And joining us in Walt's Carousel of Dreams is everyone's pal on YouTube, Mike from the party. Thank you for joining us. Hello, hello. Room. Yeah, I'm super excited to be here. And as always, go ahead and like and subscribe if you're watching this over on youtube.com slash watch podcast. Or if you're listening to the audio version, subscribe and rate this bad boy five stars. It'll keep this uh, disaster going. You know what I mean? <laughs> if that's what you're into. Uh, just getting this out of the way up top. I had like a severe allergic reaction before this. Apparently, I uh, I have no idea how it happened. I guess oh, no, actually, I do know how it happened. I just ate something that has something that I'm allergic to. Uh, but I had Benadryl, but my voice sounds even more nasally than usual, which is fun for everybody that's listening. Uh, my face was pretty swollen, too. But you know what? When it comes to the carousel of progress, nothing stops the progress. I'm here. It's just the wheel keeps turning. We do have our guests choose the topic for uh, for these episodes. So what? why why, uh, why carousel of progress? Okay, so to start off, I adore this attraction. I want to lay that on the ground because yeah. I know you're trying to create like an objective metric. I just want to make my biases really clear i love this but more importantly my family love it so i'm one of four okay. and my two younger brothers this is both their favorite attraction so i need to be able to go back home and look them in the eye that i you know defended the carousel of progress as much as i could you but, fought with honor yeah exactly like we, it's genuinely it's quite weird the level of obsession because i guess you know as you could probably tell by the accent british so don't go on it that often that's what that but, accent is huh yeah, yeah, actually. It's a, it's a country called Great Britain. Um, yeah. That's awesome. Uh, you, you, Google it. I, I think it's I've in Epcot. It. Uh, <laughs> that's, the, that's that place that has Alton Towers, right? Yeah, yeah, and Alton Blackpool, Towers. Pe uh, Pleasure oh, Beach. Blackpool and, Pleasure yeah. Beach is a lawless land. What, uh, what was your home park, by the way? Uh, I would say Thought Park. Um, yeah, so, uh, which is quite a weird uh, park to have as your home park because they massively were invested in it throughout the 2000s. So when I was a kid, it was a kiddie park. And when I was a teen, it was a, like a teen park. Is that yeah. when it got the saw ride? Oh, uh, that was, yeah, I was probably about 16 when they added the saw ride, so probably the kind of exact right age for it. That ride but, sucks ass, right? It's supposed no, to be, very, I no. thought it was supposed to be very, very uncomfortable. And like, Oh, and, yes. And, so from a coaster perspective, super rough, but from a, like a theming perspective, it's it's pure camp. Is uh, that like an old, like, Gershlauer? Do you yeah. know who Manif is it Gershlauer the Manif Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I know coasters. Uh, yeah, I think it's Gershlauer, yeah. It, it, he's a psychopath, so you yeah. don't really need to... Yeah, I'm just very much like Coaster Go Vroom when it comes to that stuff, but I'm pretty sure it's a Gershlauer, yeah. I was going to say, you could be making up manufacturer names this entire time, and yeah. I would never be able to... There's no checks and balances on yeah, this show. It's, it's not as good as a, a Vlukuma. Yeah, uh, the, the Hokey Pokey construction company. Yeah, oh, that's my favorite. <laughs> what the fuck? Okay. <laughs> well, either way, uh, it's good that you're here to defend the ride's honor, because that's mm. always when we feel like this show is, is at its best oh, when, yeah, when sure. you already come out with the sword unholstered i see you already he this he's the first guest let it be known I'm ready for this he has a clipboard with his own notes mm. i have not seen that before and i'm a little concerned yeah. uh because normally i get to fight a fight that's very unfair and then i have a whole uh, amount of research on a clipboard now he has his own yeah. piece of ammo well so. unbeknownst to you ryan i've decided to take a day off and he's doing this. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I. <laughs> no. I did read the Wikipedia article before I came here as well, just That's in case good. there was anything else in here. But no, I watched a video a few weeks ago and made some notes because um, you know, I'm currently in California, as yes. you can tell, physically with these guys. That's correct. I didn't want to be thinking about this in the days leading up. I wanted to come with my notes prepared, ready to fight this battle. Very good. I mean, we'll we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. But until then, let's get the end of the history here, Byron. All right. Let's start with. 1956. Shortly after the opening of Disneyland, plans to expand Main Street USA were announced as Walt Disney was very impressed with how his entryway into the happiest place on earth and tribute to his childhood town of Marceline, Missouri turned out. 
This expansion plan included Liberty Street, which would have included 13 buildings inspired by the 13 colonies in addition to plans for an Edison Square, an area inspired by Thomas Edison and the pursuit of innovation. This mini land was to include a multi-act stage show called Harnessing the Lightning that would take guests through the history and future of electrical appliances, more specifically general electrical appliances, and the As purposes- the sponsor, that was the sponsor. Yeah, mm -hmm. so, so, soon to come in this history segment, uh, and the purposes that they serve. Harnessing the Lightning would also have featured a fictional character going by the name of Wilbert K, as in K for Kilo, Watt which would have given uh, guests a, a guided tour through the experience of sorts. Am I in the minority that I'm glad this project didn't happen? It sounds kind of boring. I'm not going to lie. I mean, I'm always down for more Main Street-esque stuff. Like edutainment. I mean, leaning. I don't want to live in any timeline where the Carousel of Progress doesn't exist. Oh, no, so, for sure. Exactly. Yeah. On that angle. But yeah, I'm always, I, like, I like the boring Disney rides. I also, think you don't... You don't think this has a lot of comp like in common with what would become the Carousel of Progress? It though? does, but I just don't know if I need Liberty Street and Edison Square. I don't need like an American themed thing. Well, isn't Liberty Street basically what they built in Disney World, like Liberty Square? Yeah, somewhat. Yeah, I yeah. just also harnessing the lightning. It's a pretty fucking weak name. You don't. You don't. <laughs> you don't like Mister Mister Kilowatt? Nah, it's just a little on you, the nose. You prefer for me. Mister Tom Arrow? Car Carousel of Progress, much better name than Harnessing the Lightning. All right. Well, you have to wait another page and a half at least. Um, but at the time that these original plans were cooked up, audio animatronics were not exactly figured out quite yet. So uh, both Liberty Street and Edison Square were put on the back burner as soon as Walt's focus shifted to creating the iconic 1959 Tomorrowland attractions, mm -hmm. Matterhorn, Monorail, and who wants to guess the last one? Submarines? Yeah. Nailed it. Yeah. Submarine yeah. Voyage. Nailed it. Fucking nailed it. So after the success of those three aforementioned 1959 attractions, focus would shift once again to the up and coming 1964 New York's World's Fair. Disney and the Imagineers would create four attractions to take place at the fair for sponsors such as Pepsi, the state of Illinois, Ford, and in regards to the attraction we are covering today, General Electric. The state Gen of Illinois? Was like a sponsor. State of Illinois was a sponsor for Great Moments with Mr. Lincoln. Oh, fuck. I didn't know that. Yeah. Good for them. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, General Electric, who agreed to sponsor an attraction for the fair under the condition that Imagineer John Hench, who they had already established a good working relationship with through this uh, Edison Square uh, development. By this time, audio animatronic figures were coming along quite nicely at WED Enterprises, most notably realized via Great Moments with Mr. Lincoln, which was also gearing up to debut at the World's Fair. This would lead to many of the ideas from Edison Square's Harnessing the Lightning to find their way back into the Imagineering fold. This new audio animatronic stage show was to feature four acts that introduce guests to a fictional American family that takes us through the technological achievements of the 20th century. But... Unlike the concept introduced in the 1950s for Edison Square, which would have required guests to walk from scene to scene, the Carousel of Progress is, like the name states, an actual carousel in which guests are situated along the outer rim and facing inward, in which they are rotated after the conclusion of each act in order to be situated in front of the next one. This moving theater system was engineered by Roger E. Brogy and Imagineering legend Bob Gurr. Is this the first instance when laziness led to innova uh, intervention? I I did. I it, it has a Wally effect to it. Mm. Yeah, I mean, like, because really they're like, well, we can't make <laughs> all these people walk from scene to scene. They're gonna hate that. They're already learning, so. Let's just let them sit down in a, a nice air-conditioned theater. That'll keep them awake. I don't. Yeah. Think, I, maybe the first, but definitely wasn't that what ha happened with Pirates of the Caribbean? That was meant to be a walk through wax museum, and then they added the boat element, and then and then we, Haunted Mansion was supposed to be a walk through as this, well. Yeah, um, I don't know about Pirates. I didn't know Pirates was. I only knew Haunted Mansion was supposed to be a walk through. The Museum of the Weird was like kind yes. of like an incarnation yeah. of that. No, but, I, th I think it was a pirate wax work originally, oh, and then shit. um, like that building that they built originally is is. You know, they, you take the boat beyond the berm. I think that was the original building they built for it. And then the, the plan got way more ambitious. Oh, I hope I'm right on that. <laughs> well, I mean, that's great. I can't believe you just went to Disneyland for the first time. So like... Yeah, well, but I've been like obsessed with Disneyland for Fair a enough. long, long time. But specifically more so California Adventure. 
Yeah. I was really obsessed with that as a teenager because it was when they were doing the redo. Yeah, yeah. And I just thought it was the most fascinating project ever. Oh, yeah. The construction of that, I was heavily, heavily yeah. following that as yeah. well. I could have probably, like a week ago, despite never been to California Adventure, I could probably could have drawn a map of it from memory. Oh, man. <laughs> I'm yeah. a nerd. What I'm, can I say? You're just, as, you're just as sick as we are. Yeah. <laughs> Today's show is brought to you by Microdose Gummies. You know, it feels like every day I hear another benefit of microdosing. There are countless benefits already, and so many people are now relying on it to do all sorts of things, from helping with sleep, reducing anxiety, and my personal favorite, simply vibing out. Microdose Gummies deliver perfect entry-level doses of THC that help you feel just the right amount of good. I also love these for how they help with my creativity. Creative work can be so fun and rewarding, but getting in that flow state is not always as easy as I like it to be. For me, microdose gummies can help clear all those blockers and really allow me to get in that zone to do some of my best work. Get 30% off your first order plus free shipping today at microdose.com. Promo code FYA. It's available nationwide. That's microdose.com promo code FYA for 30% off and free shipping. Microdose.com promo code FYA. Meow. Back to the show. I think another theory, I mean, I have no proof of this, but the the idea that they wanted to get a bunch of people to watch this and have fast capacity maybe the idea of getting to move people for them <laughs> they maybe they trusted that more than relying on over 200 people per showing to actually move themselves to the next scene yeah uh, i could see a little bottlenecking happening happening there but and someone would sit in your seat inevitably you know when you go into those like 3d shows yeah and they people don't walk to the end imagine that happening like three or four times oh, dude, the same attraction i swear to god that is like one of my biggest pet peeves in any sort of like theme park show or any show in general mm. when people will uh or i don't like it when you have like a great seat and you're in the middle and then someone like a cm or someone who works there will come up to you and be like hey could you scoot down all the way to make room for the folks that just came in are you thinking of the born stung tacular right now oh dude it pissed me <laughs> off so much but like now people have started to adopt the policy of like having them come in from the side so that they push the people who were there earlier rightfully Toward oh, the yeah. center. Oh, that's a nice system. So back to the history here. In addition to these performing audio animatronics, Disney would task the always reliable Sherman Brothers to create a theme song that would tie the entire experience together. What they came up with was, there's a great big beautiful oh, tomorrow. Sh shining at the end of every day. <laughs> oh god it was no, nice to you uh, please keep that. <laughs> which was this song was inspired by walt's optimism for the future they would even go on to mention that this was essentially walt's theme song uh april 22nd 1964 general electric's progress land a walt disney presentation would debut at the new york world's fair quickly becoming one of its most popular pavilions, and despite its godly capacity of over 40,000 guests per day, the attraction still boasted wait times of up to an hour. Wow. So essentially, and I think you could even see this on the advertisements, but I think they took, it had over 230 seats per theater. I think it was like 238. Every like four minutes, I yeah. think they take people. And I think if you do that math on a 12-hour day, that would equate to around 40,000 mm, or crazy. something in that ballpark. Insane. Progress Land also featured, because Progress Land was the name they had for it at the fair. Yeah. Progress Land also featured a second floor to its pavilion, which allowed guests to enjoy a projection-based Sky Dome spectacular show after finishing their carousel experience. Progress Land would run at the World's Fair over the course of its two six-month seasons, concluding with the fair on October 17th of 1965. The success of the show would inspire it to be transferred to Disneyland to be situated in Tomorrowland, which was in the process of getting a massive update at the time. So when it came to Disneyland, General Electric would stay on as the attraction's sponsor, and although most of the attraction would remain identical to the World's Fair version, the Sky Dome Spectacular would get replaced with a massive model that was being built for Walt's upcoming dream city, Epcot. Unfortunately, Walt Disney would pass away in December of 1966 and never get to see the completion of either the Epcot model or the new Tomorrowland project. July 2nd, 1967, now named Carousel of Progress, would open with the new Tomorrowland, but within a matter of a few years, attendance had already begun to experience a very noticeable decline. 
General Electric concluded that roughly 80% of the audience was from California and had already seen the show numerous times. This study indicated that General Electric's investment would have a higher ceiling over at the newly opened Walt Disney World's Magic Kingdom, where park guests were pouring in from all around the globe. Which is me. You. Yeah, yeah. You. Ever she is. You guys are going to get your own park soon for Universal Studios. Yeah, Universal right? Studios Bedford. I mean, it's, that's not what they're going to call it, but that's what I'm going to call it. How far is that from where you're at? I think, well, they're going to build like new transport links, but I think door to door currently is about 90 minutes. Uh, let's keep going here. <laughs> what was not doing great at the time was Carousel of Progress at Disneyland. So this led General Electric and the Walt Disney Company to make a deal in which General Electric would agree to sign a new 10 year contract under the condition that Disney moves Carousel of Progress to Walt Disney World. This was an easy win at the time for both parties, as the team at Disney already had aspirations of bringing Carousel of Progress to their Tomorrowland there as well. I believe actually there were like blueprints before General Electric proposed this of a, a Carousel of Progress taking place at Magic Kingdom. So they're like, oh, uh, yeah, sure. I guess we could do that for you. You just sign that new 10 year deal. So on September 9th of 1973, Carousel of Progress closes at Disneyland, which kept its structure in order to reskin the attraction as America Sings in 1974. We are not covering America Sings on You're this not. episode. Did you guys do it? No, we haven't. Nope. No, no, but did you write it? I never wrote it. Uh, I, I think by the time I was old enough to be to like remember going to Disneyland, it was already Interventions. Yeah, I don't ever recall it being anything but Interventions. Meanwhile, over at Magic Kingdom, the new Carousel of Progress was being built next to two other iconic attractions that were being constructed at the same time, Space Mountain and the Wedway People Mover. On January 15th, 1975, Carousel of Progress would open at Magic Kingdom. Notable changes from the Disneyland version included no second floor to the pavilion, although a downsized version of the Epcot model can still be seen today while riding the People Mover, but it's situated in a different area of the land. Voice actors were also recast for the show's animatronics, various show scenes were modified, and the theater now rotated counterclockwise as opposed to clockwise. The most noticeable change to the Magic Kingdom's opening iteration would come in the form of its theme song, because General Electric wanted guests to be in the mindset of buying products now as opposed to waiting for tomorrow. This resulted in the Sherman Brothers getting back to work. The result is a song entitled, The Best Time of Your Life. Are you going to sing that for us? Oh God, I got to remember. Because they actually play this melody in Tomorrowland today. It's like right. the tune, it, it goes, yeah, it's part of oh wait, so it's, wait. Now is the time, now is the, the best, best time, time of your life. Or something like that. I, I, I don't know. I've never seen this rendition of the attraction, but you could hear that melody. Like the yeah. do, 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 in like Tomorrowland, I think, I think even to this day. It's Tomorrowland here. <laughs> yeah, some people claim that they like the that song better. But I, I don't know. I, I think Great Big Beautiful Tomorrow. I think that's I just people trying to be different. Like, yeah, oh, possible. look at me. I prefer the 1970s version of the theme. Yeah. No, you don't. Yeah, I listen to the B-Sides crowd. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I think uh, uh, also, I feel like the Sherman Brothers, because they wrote that song too, they made it not as good so that they could then lobby for it to be going back to the original version, which they did do. They were the ones mm -hmm. on the forefront of being like, we should change it back to our other song. Because uh, <laughs> like basically that other song was what it was just appeasing a sponsor anyways the carousel of progress would do its thing for the next 10 years over at magic kingdom until 1985 when general electric decided to not renew their sponsorship this would lead to changes in the coming years on october 16th of 1993 the carousel of progress would close down drawing fear amongst fans of the classic show as there were concepts of a flying saucer ride to replace it Luckily, this didn't happen, and the Carousel of Progress would open again three months later. The Flying Saucer cancellation was most likely due to massive budget cuts that were made to both Disneyland and Disney World's Tomorrowland renovations. Was this because of Paris? Yeah, most Thank likely because of Paris. This is that oh, would that would, that would that would that would land properly on the timeline. As as wait, what year um, was it that the budget cuts were? Isn't so it like this a was not, thing? this uh, this this is a 1993. Oh, okay, um, sorry, that would so be early Russia. 90s, uh, right after Disneyland Paris yeah. and. And the same thing happened to Disneyland's Tomorrowland, where they kind of made, did this little like band aid. Like they they attempted to basically make it like Jules Verne inspired. Oh, kind but of. they kind of half assed it. They didn't they really certainly did inspired by Discovery Land in Paris. Yeah, right? and yeah. It's, it's like, like when horror movies say something's based on a true story, and you find out the only thing that they had in common was there was a people 
in a house. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I, I was really disappointed by Disneyland's Tomorrowland. Like, I'd heard people, like, complain about it's it. It's pretty bad, dude. But it genuinely was bad. I just yeah. thought it'd be one of those things where people were just like, oh, it used to be better in the old days. And I went to it and I was like, oh, no, this is ugly. I think it's, like, decent, but just when it's next to all the other beautifully themed and thought through lands, it, it sticks out. Yeah. And there's the fact that there's a rotting carcass up above your head as you walk around there just as a constant reminder that they don't fix things in case you don't know yeah uh for those listening <laughs> slash watching uh euro disneyland was an enormous failure they put a lot into it didn't get the return they hoped for and had to cut back on a bunch of projects which for the most part was a bad thing but in this particular case it spared us another saucer ride what is it with this company and liking yeah. saucer yeah, like they're like, obsessed with that aren't they and then yeah. the the, the t floating tires or the luigi's tires over yeah. oh yeah they land. tried that one twice they keep yeah. trying it and keep failing they should try again <laughs> <laughs> maybe they're gonna rule one day they're yeah one day ass. they'll keep trying keep going mm -hmm. so like like you mentioned with heroes at disney and the budget cuts of the early uh, 1990s this resulted in disney choosing to simply make cheap updates to their already standing attraction and modify the pavilion's aesthetic to reflect a future that never was and nice. this is like when like they threw gears on it and stuff and like <laughs> it's steampunk but not like completely leaning in like it, it, i don't know i don't know really know it's what just steam going. there's no punk to it dude <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't even know if it's steam like I don't know what they're doing there. I'm not Anyways. a big steampunk guy in general. I don't like the aesthetic. What? <laughs> no? no, I think I it. Can, I, I don't really like it. Right, no, I, I think <laughs> is it because of the Tomorrowland here that you now have this vendetta against it? No, it's just because when I look at it, my eyes hurt. No, and I, I think get real sad. I love it in a theme park because I feel like it's such a good justification for all the wacky hijinks that take place in a theme park. I just don't like everything being fucking bronze. Oh no, like there's there's places where it's done so well. Yeah, though. Rookburg in uh, Fantasia Land is a great example. Discovery Land yeah. in Disneyland Paris is a great example. Disney Sea. Disney is... Sea, yeah, mm -hmm. that's a great example. Doesn't do much for me. I don't know what to tell you. I mean. Not, you you're, you're missing out. You're go missing go out. to Disney Sea and then let me know how you. Yeah, go, go to the <laughs> Fantasia Land. Like, yeah. God, I gotta right. go there. Yeah, stay in their little pods. I want to go and fly so bad. Fly so good. Mm -hmm. Hey, that's fine. Doesn't have to, you know. Not, not even, your not your cup of tea. No, not a cup of tea. Not, a, not my cup of tea. Not even a wiggle over here. Carousel of Progress would get a new name. Walt Disney's Carousel of Progress. Whoa, I'm super creative. But oh, hey, yeah. I I appreciate it. Slapping that name on there to get some extra people in line. <laughs> as, as they should. They should. should get in line. They pay should. their respects. Um, Wait, that makes it sound like it's dying. I mean, <laughs> like he's, you are. he's already uh, dying. Maybe yes, maybe no. Oh, yeah. 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 The biggest change to the show itself came in the final act in which the future was now designed to represent a 1993 vision for the year 2000. <laughs> it's also important to note that a, a great big beautiful tomorrow um, was brought back. As the attraction theme song. When it came to Magic Kingdom. Yes. Yeah. Can you sing it one more time? Oh no. Oh. <laughs> Don't worry, I'll sing it later, Mike. Okay. You got you can only good. do it, you you can only do it as like a really bad transition. Like if there's like a weird awkward silence. Oh yeah, and then we just go and, Is that a commentary on the transitions in this ride? It's like, hey Mike, I hate you. There's a great, great big beautiful <laughs> tomorrow. It gets you out. <laughs> I wonder if they'll ever make a Walt animatronic. Oh, they probably will. Because they, they did a hologram of him in the Disney 100 exhibit. Oh, shit. Really yeah. Know. Yeah. Because I think that was here. They ha I saw it in London. It was a bit weird. In 2016, the signage and overall aesthetics would change again, getting rid of the gears in place of something more futuristic. Nice. I think it's a little cleaner now, a little more sleek. And then in 2022... <laughs> I was like, is it? I was just trying to picture it. I, I definitely went on it in 2019, but I cannot remember the like, it's not the like. most. It's not the most memorable. Okay. <laughs> no. I, th I think that they later. were just trying to make it look a little less tacky. So if that's what they're going for, they succeeded. And in 2022, there were some wardrobe changes, but overall, the uh, spirit of the attraction remains intact, and the Carousel of Progress is still seeking great, big, beautiful tomorrows to this very day. I guess that does it for the history section. Do you have anything you want to add on there? Oh, uh, no, that was really thorough. Very oh, thorough. Yeah. <laughs> let's move on to some fun facts. But before we do that, let's have a word from our sponsors. All righty, we are back. Thank you for sponsoring the show. Uh, let's get into these fun facts. The ride is about 20 minutes, uh, 21 minutes long. Wow. Uh, with a whopping rotation speed. This is how fast the carousel moves. Uh, two feet per second. A capacity of 3,600 3, riders per hour, and it has a reported cost of $15 million in 1964, which would be around $150 million today, which is bananas. Uh, B-A-N-A-N-A-S. Not, economy not doing well. 
<laughs> I mean, you also got to keep in mind that they're like on the cutting edge of these animatronics and they had plenty of them in this show. Yeah. That's true. And also they weren't paying for it. So they're probably like racking up those prices oh. being like General Electric, give us some more money. And speaking of the animatronics, apparently the Robin in the spring scene is the same animatronic used in the Mary Poppins spoonful of sugar scene. No way. Uh, and I, I did look that up in a couple different sources. That appears to be true. There are some people that think both Robins were from Mary Poppins, but the fact that, that they just recycled mm. that is amazing. So if you want to see that, it's sitting there over in uh, Walt Disney World. The 240-seat theater actually rotates around the stage, as suggested by the Carousel of Progress title. The voice actors, also rather famous for this ride. Uncle Orville... Uh, it's played by Mel Blanc, also known as the voice of Bugs Bunny. And the dad, uh, Gene Shepard, is the co-writer and narrator of A Christmas Story. Here's how Walt himself describes the eras of the scenes presented. I thought this was interesting. Uh, the 1900s, he describes as, quote, pre-electric era. Not too much to say about that one. The 1920s, he describes as, now the family has all kinds of new contraptions to make life more enjoyable, including the crystal radio. End quote. And in the 1940s, he describes as the fabulous 40s, the beginning of the electronic era and the age of television. And then finally, the last era, the 60s, which no longer stands today. That was replaced, uh, like Byron mentioned. But he said this about the 60s, quote, the wonderful family life of today with its leisurely push button living. <laughs> if he thinks that was leisurely, he might be completely aghast at how lazy we've all become. Another uh, note on the eras. Uh, the first three scenes are all 20 years apart, which is nice, just slow kind of uh, demonstration of progress. But then that fourth scene now jumps straight to the 2000s, like 60 years. I mean, I know, I know it's a bit of a jump, but I do on paper quite like the idea that it's two turn of the century scenes that bookend the, the journey. That mm. is true. Mm, it's neat. The ride actually has two unique themed songs. Uh, we talked about this. They were written by the Sherman Brothers who did a bunch of other Disney classics like music for Mary Poppins and rides like the, a small world, which Mike recently just got stuck on. Yes, I was on there in the final exit hall for 20 minutes. And every time they would cut out the music to make an announcement and then return it afterwards, people started booing. I'm sure. Were you? Was that why that guy took off his clothes? and? Uh, I was there his, thinking, I kind of get what he was going for at that point. Well, like, I don't know if you could say that. Uh, <laughs> I, was, I was like, I, 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 because it's so annoying, because the step to get off is right there. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, I know I could get that step, but I also don't want to get kicked out of this park. Um, well, I'm sure you would have done so with your clothes on. It depends. <laughs> Fair enough. You seen that footage? Yes, of course. Yeah. <laughs> really funny footage. Yeah. Like, really. I mean, awful for the people to see that, but I mean... I'll just, so yeah, carry good out. for us on the internet watching oh, it. Very yeah. good, yeah. carried yeah. out like a luau yeah. pig. Next fun fact. The Carousel Progress animatronics were programmed by Imagineers wearing a harness that recorded their movements. There's actually a great clip demonstrating this on YouTube with Walt on the actual Carousel set. There's also a really funny bit where uh, Walt is asking one of the animatronics for a smoke. Ah. And he's like, ah, oh, no smoking on set. <laughs> Would you care for your life? I don't think we better... No smoking on the stage. <laughs> in that demonstration video with the guy, the guy in the harness doing that stuff, yeah. I think they actually use that as the pre-show before you go into the theater now at Magic Kingdom. It's really oh. cool. Mm -hmm. Also, apologies to our our listeners and not our viewers because if you're if you're watching this, you're probably going to see the clip of this guy programming it. He has the funniest fucking expression on his face as he's doing this. <laughs> he clearly has never been in front of a camera before and it was just told by Walt five minutes before they shot, like, hey, I need you to come in and do the movements. And he just looks like shell shocked. Mm -hmm. entire, he looks like an animatronic more than the animatronic does. He, he looks like Buster Bluth. Yeah, he's, he's really, he's not having a good time. It's probably how I look at the moment. Like, I'm not used to this setting. I'm just a bit like... No, man, yeah. I, don't, I think you're very fluid. Oh, thank you. If I'm uh, on a, if you were going to compare my fluidity to an audio animatronic, which one would you pick and why? The A1000 ones, the oh. ones that are like really, you know, the, the ones that have the little pancake motors. Mm. I just love saying pancake <laughs> motors. Uh, speaking of animatronics, some more animatronic stuff here. Some of the molds on this attraction were reused in other rides. The grandma is in the Haunted Mansion ballroom scene in the rocking chair, and Patricia and John are both in Spaceship Earth as the violin and lute players, respectively, in the Renaissance scene. In the final scene, there's a bulletin board that says, quote, Grandma and Grandpa flight number 1964 arrives 1001. This is a reference to the opening of the attraction in 1964, and the 1001 arrival time references the attraction's opening in the Magic Kingdom on October 1st. Fun little trickery there. Also on that board is... 
Marty called Wants Changes, which is, of course, a nod to legendary Imagineer Marty Scalar, who was integral to the creation of this attraction. It's fun when they sneak these little things in. I enjoy it. All of the VR and voice commands in the final scene were actually predictions made in 1993 when the 2000s scene was conceived of. I think that's pretty cool mm. to I say that they called their shot and being like, I'm going to talk to my microwave and stuff like that. I'm assuming the technology must have been in development at the time, right? That's probably true. But I'd like to think that there's like a Nostradamus aspect to this mm. where they just really were like, I have a feeling this is where things are going and it came true. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. Well, I hope that like other predictions don't come true because at the end it's like, maybe all the technology is going to read our mind. Yeah, this is like an iRobot situation. Yeah. Because like, yeah, AI we've been talking about probably for like the last 20 years. Mm, yeah, and, and that's how the ride ends. And I find it such a like, it's meant to be like a heartwarming moment. But yeah. the, the, the sun is like, everything's going to be so automated. You'll never have to bake another Christmas turkey again. Don't worry, Dad. Someday everything's going to be so automated, you won't ever have to cook another Christmas turkey again. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then it goes, there's a great thing. And, and they, it's burnt terrifying. The, they burnt the turkey anyways. So. Oh, yeah, yeah. But I think it's the, like the but, next But iteration. they're like, yeah, yeah, like in the future, like it's like it'll just read our minds. And yeah. And, the but turkey. they pitch it as a positive thing. Yeah. And it's absolutely terrifying. It's it's such a bleak note to end on. But it's pitched as a positive thing that one day you're not even going to have to touch anything. It will just read your mind. Everything's going to be automated. And that's how the ride ends. I will say, though, if you if there's any show that's more AI proof than this show, it, I, I'd like to see it because this is a show that could not be made by AI because AI would probably like take in all the info from this and be like, these fuckers are crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I just no way I'm going to be able to produce a script from this. There's a there's the dad. The dad has an apron that says my food rocks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, is that like a uh, Food it's a, Rocks reference? It's an from a reference to food, food Rocks. There's a bunch of other references in the clothes. Like, I think the grandma's wearing, like, a reference to the uh, a prototype community of tomorrow. Like, the, the I forget what it's called. Either way, there's a reference in that shirt. I just didn't write it down. <clears throat> the original Carousel of Progress is building can be seen. Oh, this is actually pretty cool. On the map of the Stark Expo during a scene in Iron Man 2. And Stark Expo is supposed to be a fictional comp of the World's Fairs. And the song used for Stark Expo was also written by uh, the Sherman Bros. Hmm, that's so, cool. Uh, the last fun fact we have here. This is the longest running stage show in America with more performances than any show in the history of American theater, which they actually say in the show. Oh, they, they let you know. It. They, they definitely <laughs> do let you know. And the Carousel of Progress has had more performances than any other stage show in the history of American theater. And it's the only attraction in Walt Disney World that was actually worked on by Walt himself. And it was said to be, said to be his favorite. Oh, because they physically moved it across. That's why That's it counts. Yeah, he, I mean, there's video of him like, you know, chopping it up on the actual set of the, of the what's it called? Yeah, and that's why it does count. Yes, yeah. while Peter Pan's flight wouldn't because it's technically not the same one. Exactly. It's, it's, it was made in the, for the World's Fair and Walt yeah. was very much alive. It feels like a technicality. <laughs> I mean, it's said to be his favorite attraction. I don't know how true Oh, that he's got is. great taste then. Uh, is there any fun facts that you'd like to add that I missed? These aren't fun facts. These are just miscellaneous thoughts that won't fit in the world-class test. Well, the first one is, the first scene, there's an extra daughter who doesn't appear in the other scenes. Yes, the, the disappearing daughter. What happened there? She I don't really know. There's ran like, away. There's a little daughter in one of the side scrim scenes, and mm. she just never comes back. Yeah, it's a bit... I want to know what happened to her. She probably died. Yeah, and it was that's, in the early 1900s. People just died back then. Yeah, that's really well. Maybe this is why they all seem happy on the surface, but there's all those underlying tensions going on. Because yeah. this is the next thing. I think um, John and Sarah are on the verge of a divorce in the third scene. Oh, I think I think there's a whole lot going. There's on. There's a lot of tension in that scene when with the wait the third mixer, scene act one. The 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 act three scene the 1940s the 1940s one oh, where same. she has the paint mixer. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 he, and she's like. <laughs> You've ruined my food mixer, not that you care. Yes, John, you're a genius. Of course, this will ruin my food mixer, not that you'd care. Oh, good old Sarah, always the last laugh. And he's like, oh, ha, 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 isn't that funny? <laughs> Sarah's <laughs> always... It's fucking incredible, it's, dude. I genuinely, the tension in that scene is, you know when you're with a couple and they're just not getting on? That's how I feel in the audience of that scene. It's just a, oh, I'm in someone else's home and they are not getting on We're right We're going to get into that in the good and the bad, too. Okay. It's going to be fucking okay. great. That's I, can't, I cannot wait. 
let's get into some first impressions. Mike, do you remember how old you were and what you first thought of? I can't remember. I can tell you what it would have been. I would have been eight years old. Okay. Um, so I don't remember it particularly that well. But the thing is, the first time we went to Disney World, we went for two weeks and did it very, very thoroughly. Oh, my God. So That's awesome. Yeah. So I can guarantee I would have done it then. Do I remember it? No. But for me, it's always been one that I think we really enjoyed. I'm a big fan of sort of the slightly kitschy kind of older ones where it's 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 just right on my street. But do I remember what I thought of it? No, I don't. I probably really liked it. I hope I did. Well, what was the first like, what was it that made you like this ride the first time? You, I guess what experience was the first time you got off and you're like, I think this is one of my favorites. Oh, I think it's, to me, I think it's just always been like a family favorite. Because I mentioned earlier the fact that my brothers love it, the whole family loves it. So it's just one of those ones we have to do. There's a few that we feel that way about. It's a small world. It's, I guess it's the World's Fair ones that we just really like. Yeah, you really like the World's yeah, Fair. Yeah, I should have gone to the 1964 World's Fair. Well, hop in a time machine. Uh, yeah, yeah. And well, again, on the Disneyland Railway uh, a few days ago, that uh, primeval world scene. Oh, it's amazing. It's so cool. So that is kind of, I guess, the last... Oh, and great moments with Mr. Lincoln. So I went with uh, my best friend Kat to Disneyland. And I originally was going to do the trip solo. And she's like, can I join? I was like, you can come to Disneyland on one condition. And she said, what's that? And I was like, you do the Abraham Lincoln attraction with me. I was trying to get my wife to do that with me recently. And she did not want to do it. Yeah. I'm putting her on blast. That's but, fair. But what's, what, what was cool, she didn't know anything about it. And so that moment when Abraham Lincoln stands up, I heard her audibly gasp. So yeah, it's, it's pretty scary. Work. He's a big dude. Yeah. Also, yeah. it's kind of a harrowing presentation. That primeval world scene is pretty fucking scary, too. That big ass T-Rex mm. used to scare the shit out of me when I was a kid. Yeah. But that's, I guess, that's, I we went on a slight tangent, but I've always loved it. Let's go with that as my yeah. first impression. Nice. This is embedded 19, into my soul. 1964 attractions, too. I think that was like a lot of like, Claude Coates in his prime mm. yeah. doing, I think he did work on Carousel of Progress. He, obviously, the, this, the way you talked about Disneyland Railroad, he mm. did a lot of that set design. He was the dinos. Resident Spooky Man, too. And that's true, yeah. Well, ha half of Haunted Mansion mm. yes. with the, Mark the Davis. Half. Yeah, <laughs> They're both good halves. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but I like the uh, Mr. Part, Toad, right? Snow White. Yeah. What was your first impression of this ride, Byron? You know, I'm sure as a baby, I... Uh, <laughs> You experienced it. it that you're about to tell a tale of you on no this as a no baby. no unfortunately yeah. not and then uh <laughs> the first time i recall writing this was in the end of 2019 yeah. my family went for the holidays and <laughs> this was like during the time i was getting introduced to like theme park youtube because like i'd always like kind of been like a you know as a little kid like grew up as kind of a roller coaster and like theme park nerd like kind of on my own mm. i didn't realize there was like a big community mm. out there of like fellow sickos and stuff like that from 2015 to 2019 was like when i first started getting introduced to oh wow there's like a bunch of people out there that are like nerding out about this and like starting to put out videos which were the channels that were like <sighs> impacting you at that point defunct land was the big one oh, i course, think yeah. i think that was King. like the big gateway i think there was a little bit of bright sun films oh, yeah, at yeah, the yeah. time there was like those abandoned mm. videos um but that was like when you started noticing the community was like like big Disney fans were bringing up Carousel of Progress, this Carousel, you like you get you get the other ones in like Horizons, or yeah, like, you know, yeah, and like that was like kind of like, those were like the cool attractions to bring up, mm. like the old the, the old school like classics to show that you were in the know, yeah, because yeah. like no 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 like average tourist or anything going to Disney like yeah I went to the Carousel of Progress, <laughs> and like, <laughs> the, the it is a great weird. big beautiful tomorrow, yeah. But I think what I love um, about its reputation compared to stuff like Horizons and Journey to Imagination, I think with those there's almost a sense of because they're like lost to time they're almost like better in people's well not that they're better in people's head i never wrote it but they take on this this mythic quality yes. that you can't write it now so what's cool about this is you can go on it on your vacation to disney world and it's still great so it doesn't have that sort of if it closed down i imagine it would have more of a mythic thing that people are like oh you know you'd move from scene to no, scene no for sure people are like whoa it does have like a time machine quality to it <laughs> where you feel like you're stepping back in time going into this this, uh, this attraction kind of a, into a, a way of how they used to make rides back in the day yeah. I kind of feel that way with Spaceship Earth yeah I love Spaceship Earth we're gonna have an episode on that soon eventually um, I think but yeah but for this this 2019 experience I had like convinced my family like late at night to go because oh, there's no wait <laughs> for this thing and so I was like, oh, I kept hearing, I kept seeing these comments about Carousel of Progress. And there's videos coming out on Carousel. I'm like, hey, like, let's do this. Let's do the Carousel of Progress. And they're like, all right, let's go. Like, we, you know, we 
pretty much done everything else. And I remember like sitting in the theater and not realizing it was like, going to be like 20 minutes long and like have these silly transitions of singing <laughs> Great Big, which I didn't realize because I had heard Great Big Beautiful Tomorrow several times over the course of my childhood because Mr. Tom Aro, which was like an actual like animatronic figure that they had at Tomorrowland and Disneyland during the 90s, which was Interventions. It was not, you know, it was no longer Carousel of Progress. He still sang. And a great big beautiful tomorrow, cause tomorrow's happening today. So when they started singing it in here, I was like, oh, this is the origin yeah. of that song. How did I not know that? It's, it's fascinating the spread mm -hmm. of the song, actually, because I used to work at the Disney store in Dublin, Ireland. Oh, wow. And uh, in, I don't know if it's in the Disney stores here, but at the end of the day, each day, and I got one of my friends who remembers that job hasn't memory hold it in the way I have because I hate that job. Um, <laughs> apparently at the end it said, another day is coming to a close here at the Disney store. And remember, there's a great big beautiful tomorrow shining at the end of every day. And they would say that at the end of every single day in that shop. And I think that's so cool because that's so detached from the original context. Yeah. It's just selling, you know, Marvel toys. Wait, so to be clear, they would have you sing the song? No, or? no, it was like an announcement, like when they closed the shop. I mean, they should have made us sing it. That would have been great. <laughs> it's like almost dystopian. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that was a dystopian job for sure. Oh my God. Yeah. Uh, speaking of the song too, that kind of leads into my first impression, which was, I also knew this song as well, but that's because I had that like Disney uh, Parks music album that had like two discs. And this no. was one of the tracks on it where it had like the actual ride audio on there. Wait, was it specifically a Walt Disney World album or? There was a Walt Disney World one and there was I, a Disneyland one. It was I like had the Walt Disney World one. It was like one. an anniversary. They're on Spotify. Yeah. Um. So I didn't know what this attract this this was from. And then uh and then eventually over you know becoming more of a nerd, I realized it was from this ride. I had not actually gone on this ride until last year when we were in Orlando for the tour. We had somehow missed it a bunch <laughs> of times. Uh. Which which tour was? It? Oh wait, oh, for, wait, for the Ghost Files tour. Oh my gosh, that, this was October. Yeah, that was my first time. Wait, you only did it six months ago? I guess so, six months ago. <laughs> I love how like the first time for Journey and Imagination yeah. and this one, I didn't realize the those two were your first. Rides. Those were your first time on and that. What's funny is we actually got on. We saw it the first time. I was delighted by it. Uh, there was a couple moments in there where I was like, mm, something weird going on with his dad, and then the ride just stopped right towards the very end of the uh, final scene. And then they're like, uh, a voice came over the speaker and was like, hey, guys, sorry, something happened, blah, blah, blah. You're going to have to do it all again. And <laughs> and we just watched everything just reset. And then we just sat through another 20 minutes of it. And that's when I really was able to hone in on what's going on with this dad. The things because if it was a normal first time, I would have been like, oh, that was a little weird. Go on with my day, come back, do it the next time I'm in Disney World, maybe a year or two from then. And then I would have had that same thought of just like, oh, there's something weird, but to be able to do it back to back mm. and really be able to analyze it mm. was a really rare experience. Shane was there. We were singing the song. This attraction's like right up Shane's alley. Oh, it definitely is up Shane's alley. Yeah. That, that little, like that little corner of Magic Kingdom, that, that Tomorrowland, that's like- I do love the attraction though. Yeah. Uh, and with that, let's get into the good and the bad. Uh, you know, we talk about the good and the bad things of the ride. And of course, Mike, if there's anything you want to toss in here or anything you want to defend. I, oh, I'll, I'll be throwing into the good. Yeah, for sure. I'm sure you will. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but before we do that, let's have a word from our sponsors once again. And we're back. Thank you for supporting the show. Let's get into these goods and these bads. The first good I want to get out of the way. And look, this could be a bad for some people, but I think it's very good because I enjoy it. Uh, number one thing, this dad is sad. <laughs> and I love it. I, I, we're going to touch on that throughout these goods. I just want to point it out up top. There's plenty of instances where you're like, hey, I think this guy hates his life. Yeah. <laughs> and what's supposed to be a very forward looking, optimistic ride. There are just so many hints of di in the dialogue. Like this guy is about to do something horrible. Yeah. <laughs> He's out there about to. <laughs> and this is a good. It's a good. I, it's would, a good, I would call that good. I think it's really, yeah. it's good storytelling. Mm. It's layered. It's nuanced. It's new. I mean, some of it pretty like. Like, I think you need to talk to somebody, man. Mm. Anyways, uh, first thing I wrote, other than that, I like the beginning VO. I like when the guy comes over the loudspeaker and he gives you the whole razzle-dazzle. Welcome to Walt Disney's Carousel of Progress. Oh, you're in for a real treat. Makes you, like, basically he's, that whole thing is there just so yeah. he could explain, hey, we realize you want to be on Space Mountain right now. You're not. You're in this goofy-ass theater. 
here's some reasons why you should be happy to be here. I love that line where he's like, oh boy, you're in for a treat. And yeah. I'm like, yes, we are. <laughs> yeah. uh, the, do you guys know Sporkle, where you like guess like oh, yeah. all 150 Pokemon, for example? Yep. Once we were on like a family road trip and my brother got up a Sporkle for the Carousel of Progress intro. Oh, wow. Um, and... It was genuinely, it's only got like 120 plays. I checked it recently and I think like 20 of them are like some member of my family. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, we I it, we just sat there and tried to remember the intro from it and being like, you know, treat, yeah. whoa, progress, America. You yeah. know, just trying to guess buzzwords that would be in there. They literally say that, they say the more performances than any show in the history of American theater. Yeah. And I was like, whoo, man. It's impressive. I mean, do it's an interesting because I, I, it's definitely correct. But the, I, if we consider robots to be theatre, but it's, a, it's quite a bold leap to call it theatre. I agree, but I don't think it's something that naturally to me. I feel like theatre needs. It's a bit of a stretch, but they need to have a reason for you to be like, "I'm happy. I'm here." And yeah. Not immediately dreading it. I'm not gonna lie. The first time I saw this, I got pumped up when I heard this video. I was like, "All oh, right, it's so good." You know. And make you feel like Walt sneezed in there, which he probably did. And I think a lot of the old rights, adding historical context is really useful to appreciate where you're coming from. You could make the argument, though, that if your ride needs the historical context, it's probably not that good of a ride. I, I disagree. I think that's something oh, if you I'm can appreciate the but time then, like, it's from. Why would you go into a museum then? No, if there well, are, you know, I think I think reading every plaque in a museum, Byron. <laughs> I'm reading them. I'm not like digesting it. Yeah, you're just, <laughs> just, just passively. Reading. I'm like, mm, yes, I'm being smart right now. I'm being exquisite. That's exactly how I feel I'm a like, lot of what? times in the museum. I'm unfortunately, like, what, what did you learn in there? I'm like, oh, I don't know. Just vibes. I like going <laughs> yeah, into like, museums and just having a good time. You yeah. don't need to learn something. But it's interesting on the historical context point is when I went to Blackpool Pleasure Beach for the first time last summer, yeah. and I went on this dark ride, and I was like, yeah, that was fine. And then someone after I went on Wikipedia afterwards and found out it opened in 1906 or something and i was like oh for that time oh, that's incredible yeah. that i and i felt like if i knew how old like literally like 50 years before disneyland i would have appreciated more but i was like oh yeah this is like a bit older rundown but it was fine and then when i went in with that context i was like oh right that's cool i think it'd be obvious when you get on this ride and then you rode the ride. big one and then <laughs> no i didn't because you didn't too, rode the big one it was too windy oh yeah they, I, don't, I don't think you need a context for that one right uh, like, i think uh, you you need to, well, maybe you need to know that it was used to be sponsored by Pepsi Max because it's still a giant Pepsi Max can at the oh, beginning. Oh, shit. Um, but yeah, they built it so it was like the more aesthetic thing that was facing the seafront, but it means the wind is like hitting the side of it. So it's loads of times it's closed. Um, so I've, I've been to Blackpool twice and it hasn't been open. I've been there three separate days and every single time it's been closed. Oh, dang. Is huh. that still the tallest coaster in the... No. Uh, well, Hyperia has just been topped, uh, topped it in terms of height, but it hasn't... Mm -hmm started operating so the structure of hyperia is taller than the big one gotcha but the coaster isn't open so give it a month and a half pretty and embarrassing no for it. the coaster's actual name is the big one yeah mm, very inventive pretty, well, pretty, pretty embarrassing to be called the big one yeah there's a coaster that's now bigger yeah they're gonna have to rename it that's like the was it the 80s or 90s of build oh, like the big one i think would be the late 90s oh, the I, second biggest one the second biggest one have, yeah doesn't they should quite, lean into it doesn't have quite as much of a ring but you know whatever yeah. Next thing I wrote down, the sound of the theater rotating. I know this is not, a bad, you know, most people would have this as a bad, be like, put some WD-40 on that bad boy. But I kind of like the weird sensation of like, are we going to die right now? Like this theater is like kind of vibrating in such a way that only happens in an earthquake. Yeah, I never feel like I'm going to die on it because I think the fact we're on the ground makes yeah. me feel safer. But I do get your point of that. I like that rickety feeling of some rides. Like, exactly. I prefer Space Mountain in Florida to Space Mountain over here because of that feeling of it feels like it's about to collapse any so moment. You like the feeling of like you, you're feeling the track. Yeah. Yeah. I like when there's a coaster and it feels like that. I like leaning over to whoever I'm with and like quoting Barbie and be like, do you guys ever think about dying? And it adds so much <laughs> to the experience. Well, just this theater rotating, like just that rumbling sound, like the boulder rolling oh, in Indiana Jones yeah. with this like kind of goofy mm -hmm. song playing it's just really funny i found myself very uh taken by it which also brings me to my next good the first time you hear that song i like they start you early it starts immediately and you're kind of like okay goofy song i don't know what how i feel about that but it plants the seed that that's going to become the transition device through all the scenes and i you don't really catch on to it yet but you're just kind of like okay i guess a catchy song it's a little weird that it's playing out of nowhere may the century begin it's a great I like it. I also like the point of view of all the scenes. They're presented as happening now, like a present day kind of meditation on the past. It's not like 
back in the day we used to use the, the ice box or some shit like that it was it's it's seen as if it's happening right now and you see the same family at the same age throughout all the eras i think that's really cool yeah uh i, I think they get that. slightly older as it goes on don't i they? wondered that they look they do look like they get a little older but yeah. then like the, the kid the son definitely jimmy he's definitely older in the final scene than that's at true the beginning. which is an interesting choice because it's like they're aging yeah. but they're not aging the 20 years that yeah. is suggested you, by you the timeline like you, yeah you feel like you'd either do the simpsons flotational timeline thing yeah. or age them well yeah. you know not if you imagine if they did age them and they're just all dead by the end yeah <laughs> just a bunch of skeletons <laughs> yeah carousel of progress right to the edge uh the fucking tombstone I, I i guess that's true they do age them a little bit which is even weirder and mm. i love it uh well, i i also i got put my good kind of similar to what you're bringing up like the reoccurring themes yes works really well so every act is a holiday mm. the character traits kind of stay relevant i love every act starts with oh like there couldn't be a better time to live at than right now exactly like, things couldn't be any better than they are today you like he usually like travel is like one of the first things yeah. uh john i think is the name of the dad yeah uh, brings up so it's like at, at the beginning so like, you can go to New York to California in only seven days yeah. now and then it goes to three days now and yeah and, the repeating um, motifs are amazing and, and the whole it's never gonna work thing about some new fangled oh, thing he, that's about to happen he's talking Which, about flight the airplanes like yeah. two guys over in Carolina making yeah, something it's, it's never like gonna the Wright work brothers. <laughs> then he brings up uh, what Char 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 <laughs> Charles Lindbergh flying yeah. across the Atlantic he's not gonna do it and I even hear tell about two brothers from North Carolina who are working on some kind of flight Flying contraption. <laughs> It'll never work. Very funny. He could have been really punny there. I could have been like, they'll never get it right. Another thing I like here is the uh, the, the appliances kind of opening themselves as he talks oh, about Oh, so them. fun. It's kind of like a Pee Wee's Playhouse kind mm -hmm. of feel to it. We've now got gas lamps, a telephone, and the latest design in cast iron stoves. And that reservoir keeps five gallons of water hot and just three buckets of coal. Oh, well, that sure beats chopping wood. And isn't our new ice box a beauty? Look at that. Just a, I, it's a goofy ass idea on paper, on the paper. I bet <laughs> I'm a sucker for that water pump yeah. at the beginning. Oh. And thanks to progress, we've got a pump right here in the kitchen. Of course, we keep a bucket of water handy to prime it with. Yes, sir. We've got everything we need to make life easier. Why is there? It's so appeasing to hear the little hinge. <laughs> Like and watch the water pump. Well, I go often up look at sinks and imagine they have funny little faces. Oh, you know, like the faucets or the nice. eyes. So I get in the big ass mouth. Like, ooh, <laughs> spit your toothpaste in me. Yum, yum, yum. Was this on the second ride through where you're getting slightly delirious? Or I think this is the Benadryl talking. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> then, uh, and, and yeah, like things that kind of really make you. They they did a good job of isolating small sentences that really place you in that time. Like when uh, when his wife when Sarah is saying like. Oh, we could, you know, heat the water without no more kerosene or, or no, just talking about how you could flip on light switches and you don't need yeah. candlesticks and yeah. kerosene, no more gas. And it just makes me think of like how awful it would have been mm. to have to carry around which a fucking open flame in your house to see. Which, by the way, pretty neat that they bring back Thomas Edison multiple times into this uh, mm. show. Yeah. So it kind of has full circle where this the, the original concepts came from Edison Square. Mm. Oh, Yeah. That's true. I never really thought about that. Yeah. They call, what she call them the uh, the, the snap-on electric lights. Yeah. Electric lights? The snap-on electrical lights. And I like in the first scene where it references like a World's Fair. That yeah. feels like a nice little nod to mm -hmm. what the audience would have been seeing at the time. Though. A little wink. Yeah. Which also takes me to the side scrims. I think those are marvelous storytelling devices. I did not know those existed the first time I saw this. So when I saw that in place, I was like, wow, that's really fucking cool to yeah. have these like scrims basically that you could see through at certain points and that there's little mini carousels inside the scrims mm, a carousel inside a carousel a 180 degree rotating carousel that could show like a different scene like you see that with like patricia like doing whatever the fuck she's doing in her room and then like uncle lester or not uncle lester what is his name oval Oroville, that's right. The disappearing daughter. We already talked about that. Yeah, very she's important. she's in the first scene. Is that on your list of good things? It is. I like that there's a girl that goes missing and we don't know we there's never acknowledged. They're just like, oh yeah. You know, she 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 got salmonella. I also totally buy the outside being through the windows. I think it's very well done. Mm, yeah. The sets are beautiful. Next thing I wrote here is little pervy kid. <laughs> That's right. We're talking about his uh son who what's his name again in this? Um wait, well, I think in the first scene he's called James and then That's later right. becomes like he Jimmy is, and Jim. Yeah, James. Well whatever. He's up to no good. He's sitting there looking at his dad's old timey little goggles. The I forget what they're called. The stereoscope. The stereo kaleidoscope. Something scope. Oh, we look at that. 
Now, James, I thought I told you to ask my permission before using my new stereoscope. At first, you're thinking, oh, he's just playing with his dad's, like, expensive equipment. And then you listen to the dialogue, (laughs) and you realize he's, like, looking at his dad's, like, basically, like, old school porno. Like, his old school, like, kind of naughty pics. Here's what the kid says when he's looking through after the dad's like, put that down. The kid goes, quote, ooh la la. So that's little Egypt doing the hoochie coochie, eh, dad? Ooh la la. So that's little Egypt doing the hoochie coochie, eh, dad? Which is crazy to me that this was like approved dialogue that Walt was like, nice, every dad will relate to this. I mean, from the character angle, the more interesting thing is he when he says to the son, put that away before your mother finds it. And that's the thing. The dad just leans in. He doesn't be like, hey, I don't know what you're talking about. He just goes, isn't she a knockout? <laughs> that's a quote. Isn't she a knockout? Isn't she a knockout? She's the star of the new World's Fair in St. Louis and, <clears throat> and you put that away before your mother finds it. Oh, dad. You heard me. What was he about to say? Was he about to say that she's the star of, like, a new, like, you know, kind of... I'm assuming it's a real person who was really at the World's Fair. I haven't actually looked this up. But why is he clearing his throat like that? Is he saying that she's, like, the star of, like, a like a softcore porno or something like that? Or just, like, just like a movie where she's scantily clean? I don't know. It's a weird scene to be in this ride. It has yeah. no real reason to be there. Yeah, except character development. We need to know this dad it's, is is unhappy in his yes, marriage. He's exactly. got he's got his vices. That, that's why it's that. And then uh, there's another crazy scene. I think it's in the same scene. <laughs> yeah, it's because it's, it's just the Valentine's Day dance. That's the first scene. Mm. There's a scene where the scrim rotates around, and then you see his daughter Patricia, Patricia and she says, "Quote, Papa, all these people, I'm I'm indecent." And then the dad says to ease her mind, don't worry, Patricia, they're friends. <laughs> don't worry, Patricia, they're friends. It's all good. These are just my buddies from the office. They're fine seeing you like this. It's all good. Yeah. And it's weird because it's one of the few moments we directly refer to as the audience. Yeah. it's Because it, most of the time it's just kind of, he's just monologuing and it's kind of ambiguous what's taking place. And that's the only point where it's like, oh no, we are physically inside his house within this narrative. Well, because she's like, and essentially what you would clarify is like her underwear. There's like a corset and there's like yeah. that. Like if I was like putting on my underwear in my room and my dad opened the door yeah. and I was like, dude, I'm in my underwear. And he's like, don't worry. These are all my friends. This is Mike. Yeah. <laughs> be like and <laughs> yeah and from from the party he could see I, the outline of my goods dude yeah. i would like to bring i'm indecent into everyday life yeah i, I mean I, I do have a repertoire of carousel of progress quotes i do utilize in daily life but <laughs> father i'm indecent isn't in there yet but add i think it, i'm gonna add, add, it. It to, add it to the arsenal i yeah. think he's yeah. drunk i think this dad is drunk i think he has a drinking problem his mm. marriage is on the rocks yeah and he just doesn't know where he is it's he's, interesting you, you say he because i feel more sorry for sarah i think sarah is the one gritting her teeth through it i think he's kind of oblivious to how much he's hurting her i think he was at first and now he just doesn't care oh uh that's sad. my theory moving on here i know i just like this quote the dad says, uh, I think this is in the second scene. He says, I think I'll take one of those newfangled trolleys down to the drugstore soda fountain and meet the boys for a cold sarsaparilla. Oh, well, with all this talking, I've worked up quite a thirst. <laughs> I think I'll take one of those newfangled trolleys down to the drugstore soda fountain and meet the boys for a cold sarsaparilla. I mean, that's just really all guys want in life. Yeah, I mean, I, I like yeah. that bit afterwards, Which, like, oh, no, we, we're drinking root beer now. It's the same thing, right? But yeah. Then, yeah. He, he talks about how the advancement of root beer. Because I don't think root beer is not really a big thing uh, in the UK, but it's more common here. And I, I genuinely just got it just to oh, so make a reference. Good. It's the Just ran- to be like, oh, we're drinking root beer now. It's the ranch of colas. Doesn't that sound incredible, though, just throwing back a chili sass with the boys at the soda fountain? I don't know what any of those words mean, but yes. A sarsaparilla? You never had a sarsaparilla before? No, but I I know it's like root beer. It's kind of like root beer. It's like root beer V1. Okay. Oh, and so it's still sold. It's still a thing. It's still sold. There's, it's a little spicier than root beer. Mm-hmm. I will keep an eye out. You know, like if you ever had like a ginger beer and like the yeah. ginger has a real like kick, kick to it. it. Right. Sarsaparilla is like a very kicky root beer. Mm. To Mike, me, don't feel bad. I didn't know what sarsaparilla was until this attraction. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. <laughs> See, I, I, I assumed it was something that was sold You're in the 1900s, but wasn't now. He's not but, a real American. I don't know my pop. Yeah, yeah, clearly. It's uh, patriotic to not know sarsaparilla. <laughs> also, he does this. Oh, ha, ha, I'm sorry. I forgot we're drinking root beer now. <laughs> Which is like just like kind of like a get off my lawn moment there. Mm. Um, and then from that point, we hear the second time of, of the song. And uh, speaking of progress, there's a great big beautiful tomorrow. You know, the, that scene ends. Actually, this all was a 
the early the the first scene. I love the transition. I think I think it is in that first act where it, he just goes. Speaking of progress, there's a great. And he just starts. <laughs> he just breaks out in the song. It's it's like this is my problem sometimes with musicals. Like I love a musical where they sing the dialogue and yeah. stuff, but sometimes the transition is just kind of like the transition is we're gonna now sing, yeah. <laughs> and that's kind of what happens here. I mean, the most awkward one to me is going the third into the fourth scene where. Sarah is clearly having a really rough time and he's like it's incredible he's like I mean you might have the quote there but he's like come on cheer her up let's all sing her song (laughs) and it's so good for the whole audience to be like that's a good it's really fucking amazing and also the second time you hear the song is when you start to realize oh they're gonna play this song after every act so the next time they play this song I'm gonna be ready Mm. and I'm gonna start fucking singing it too Uh, also moving on to the next scene uh, not also moving on to the next scene, uh, the 1920s. We're moving from the ni- 1900s to the 1920s here. Uh, there's a part where the dad is talking about the uh, the invention of the car, essentially, and his neighbor honks his horn. He's like, oh, he sure loves that horn. <laughs> <laughs> there goes Schwartz in his Hupmobile. He sure loves that horn. And I just love hearing a funny little 1920s car horn. Mm. You know, you get a, a hint of it in Killers of the Flower Moon, but then you can't really enjoy it because he's a bad man in that movie. I, I enjoyed that you're comparing Killers of the Flower Moon to the Carousel Program. I think so, because they both have a guy going vroom, vroom in a funny way. He's yeah. probably got those funny driving goggles on, too. And, yeah. you know, the, the horn, like, wah, wah, you know, it sounds like a Toontown horn. Did yeah. he call them horseless trolleys? He called them horseless trolleys. He did call them that. And then he says, as Byron said, the first scene, he says we could travel from New York to Los Angeles. I think it was, where is it? It was originally seven days, and the second seven time days. it's three days? Yeah. yeah. Three days is the second. Now we could travel from New York to Los Angeles by train in only three days. We could travel from New York to Los Angeles by train in only three days. And then there's also this really funny Pee Wee's Playhouse moment in this where all the lights go off. He blows a fuse. Go there, you blow a fuse. Crap. That's the third one this week. I buy fuses by the case. Oh. He mentions he, he's done it a couple times. Alcoholic. I think this guy just drinks a lot. I love that moment in the darkness where it's just the audio design hearing the guy, the, the sun walk across. Yeah. I think it's it just really, I, I love a good use of just like pitch back and audio in a theme park attraction. What I also like is that the window outside still is lit to mm. make it look like outside. So you see them silhouetted and mm. it makes them feel somehow more real. Like I really buy that we're in a house where all the lights went out. Yeah. Also, I wrote, I guess this is the first time I really saw it. I think this guy hates his wife. There's a moment where he's saying something to her and she she tells him something that was correct. You know, I'm so glad we installed an electric light fixture here on the porch because it's just too darn hot to be sawing inside. Yes, Sarah. Yes, Sarah. And it's just like this really just kind of weird tone. Uncle Orville. A king. This guy's a bum. <laughs> Wait, you don't like him? I love him. Oh, okay, good. Yeah, the speaking of that guy, uh, the dad describes him as, quote, perennial house guest. And yeah. he, here's another quote of him talking about Orville. <laughs> Orville's taken over the coolest spot in the house, of course. And then he's uh, seeing that Orville's reading a newspaper because Orville's sitting in the bath. And he says, <laughs> too bad he's not reading to help one of ads. Just referring to the fact that this guy's a bum who needs to get a job. Yeah, uh, I, I love that. It's 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 kind of the equivalent of like replying to someone's um, tweet with Indeed.com. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> now. But the thing is, he then goes on to suggest that this guy invented air conditioning mm, which is a true fact oh, yeah, yeah it was a guy called orville pirelli who now i'm making this up. Oh, i was about to say <laughs> it's well crazy played. that he's like this guy's a fucking loser this air conditioning thing's never gonna work out uh another thing about that scene he's just the dad just watching orville take a bath well, it's interesting that you brought up the the Patricia thing earlier because it's another privacy invasion that we are complicit in yeah and orville mm-hmm. says there's no privacy in this house. He says that later in it as well. Yeah. No privacy at all around this place. Sorry, Orville. And it's just like, yeah, I get it. If someone watched me taking a bath, I'd be pissed off too. You see, I only realized when researching for this that he said no privacy at all around here because I thought he was saying, because you know that thing you were saying about him inventing air conditioning. I thought he was saying no progress at all around here. No. And it was like he's ahead of them in the curve. And when it, I read it was the privacy quote, I was like, oh, this is like a lot more, I feel icky about the fact we're looking at him in the bath now well imagine you're staying at your brother-in-law's house mm. and you're reading like you're scrolling through your phone in the bathtub and he opens the door and it's just like sipping on some coffee going when are you gonna get a job yeah 
And he's yeah. like, why don't you stop talking to me in the tub? You With all his weird. friends in yeah. tow. <laughs> don't worry. They're my friends. <laughs> We're going to watch you scrub a dub. Yeah, dub. 238 of them. Uh, yeah, 238 <laughs> of them. Uh, and then after that. It just can't get any better. Just goes to show that there's a great, big, beautiful tomorrow shining at the end of every day. We go into the next scene, the 40s. We hear the song the third time. It's a banger. By this point, everyone's singing along. It's a great transition device. Gorgeous kitchen in the 1940s scene. Mm. I don't know. I just wrote that. Just, no, it is. It's really aesthetic. It's very nice. Kind of reminds me of, I know it's a decade later, but that primetime cafe yeah. in uh, mm. Hollywood oh, Studios. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. Yeah. And then they also touch on the ice and the dishes, things that they've mentioned in the earlier scenes. So you could see the progress of things. Very just, visually aste- or aesthetically pleasing fridges during that era. Mm. Yeah, I just think they did a really good job of picking mundane kind of small items that improved people's lives that would make us go, oh, I'm very much in the context now of like how stoked I'd be about having a fridge that could hold that much ice. Yes. <laughs> I would just want a fridge that's that color now, that aesthetic, you know, with all the mod cons of a fridge now, a refrigerator. Yeah. Do you call it? Yeah. Next good I have here. Oh, wait, what is what the fuck? Oh, this is just another quote of him being a sad man. <laughs> Here's a quote from him in this 1940s scene. Turn today on the radio. Fella says, we've got something now called the rat race. Did you ever hear that one? It sure describes my life. <laughs> a sad, sad man. Uh, it's a, uh, I think even his mom then chimes in and goes like, uh, that's progress or something like that. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's what they call progress there. To try and calm him down. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is what I like about it is it, it contextualized the good changes in the ones which maybe are less pleasing to the current era. Exactly. And it, it, they're kind of, they are on the surface, but they're a little under, like this next mm. quote. There are some parts of this show where the dialogue is unintentionally bleak mm. and just gives a, an insight into this family that's not really happy. He says he's talking about television. He's trying to talk about something that's like a great advancement. He says, we do have television when it works. Gives you something to do after you come home, which is just like mm. the thought being like all this guy now looks forward to is coming home to watch TV and then not talk to his kids or his wife. <laughs> it's just crazy. Uh, also in that scene. Really funny. And this is something the grandma repeatedly kind of repeats. There's strange characters in this. The grandma has like a bloodlust to her. Mm. There's a grandma. She's talking. She's watching like a fight and she goes, give him a left, you big lug. Give him a left, you big lug. And then later when she's playing VR in the final scene, she's, oh, she says something crazy there too. Wait, yeah. hold on. What is it? She says, take that, you nincompoop, after she starts killing someone. <laughs> she's just locked into violence. It's a strange family. Uh, there's also some good brother sister Razin in the scene. Mm. You know the the boy says, "Hey dad, what do you think of my jack o' lantern?" And he says, "Oh boy, that's scary." And he says, "That's because I used my beautiful sister Patty's picture for a model." It's fun stuff. Yeah, yeah. I don't have a sister. I imagine there'd be some fun stuff like no, this. No, I, I only have brothers, but that feels like the sort of point scoring that we do against each other. But some what screwing? Like point scoring? Oh, point scoring. I see. <laughs> yeah. Wait, what did you think I said? I think you said point screwing. I, no, I still don't know no. what point scoring means. <laughs> no, no. no, like you know, like scoring points against each other. Ah. Yeah, I mean, no one's t- keeping count, but. And then, oh, here's the scene you were talking about. Oh, which one? The the. <laughs> oh, is this the um. Mixo. Yeah, there's a really funny transition from the third scene, the 1940s to modern day, and it just is kind of the cherry on top of the bleakness of Mm. this relationship. Uh, There's (laughs) first Sarah is putting a paper on a wall, and they're they're trying to uh, wallpaper their uh, rumpus room. There's a really bad joke in there. A lot of the stuff in here, we could talk about that later, but she's putting up up uh, wallpaper in this room, and she says, Sarah says, John, uh, this papering is getting out of hand. I could use a little help. And he said, <laughs> and he says, now, Sarah, didn't I set up that clever automatic paint stirring machine for you? And and then she's. <laughs> yes, John, you're a genius. Of course, this will ruin my food mixer. Not that you'd care. And then the paint stirrer blasts her with paint. And she starts saying like, hey, this, this thing I asked you for help with that you gave me this thing, it, it actually made it worse. And he doesn't help at all. He just says, like, I always say, if you're going to be married, marry a girl with a sense of humor. Well, it's time to move on. 
Let's cheer up Sarah by singing our song. Come on, everybody. There's a great, big, beautiful tomorrow. Uh, let's all cheer up Sarah by singing for her. <laughs> like, basically insinuating, like, that she's just this, like, grumpy wife that's, like, nagging him. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, Sarah always gets the laughs laugh. Why don't, you know what, why don't we all try and cheer up Sarah? Let's all sing for Sarah. Yeah. And it puts us in a comfortable position of, you know, if you have, like, to like a friend who are a couple and they're fighting and someone goes what do you think that's kind of what we're being brought into as the audience like sing for sarah go on cheer her up and we just have to awkwardly sing the song at that point he also says like oh she always gets the last laugh like it's one of those things where there's two people fighting and one of them thinks they're joking around mm. and the other one clearly doesn't mm. and then he's so oblivious that he goes like he's pointing it out to us that they're joking around yeah. And like you said, he's asking us all to be like, hey, why don't we just sing for her? That'll make her be happy for once. Yeah. Uh, a lot of ball and chain stuff here. Yeah. Were I, you, were you going to bring up the, the rump joke? Because I, yeah, I, yeah. I only just cut, clocked onto that today. Oh, no. Yeah. Because um, I didn't know. I was like, what does the word rump mean? It means butt. Yeah. It's like it's a butt joke. It's a butt joke. Yeah. Um, what is the joke exactly? He's saying like. She, she goes, um, I just got paint all over my rump. I mean, rumpus room. <laughs> Sarah. Oh, you and your progress. That paint mixer of yours just sloshed paint across my rump. A rumpus, a room. <laughs> yes, that's right. Yeah. And he goes, ha ha ha. He said, if you, ha if you have to get married, make sure you do it to someone who has a sense of humor. <laughs> Ooh. Yeah. And there's, there's a line in the Valentine's <laughs> scene earlier where he's like, or, or one of the earlier oh, scenes, man. definitely, where he's like to Rover, he's like, you're lucky, you're a dog, you don't have to date. Yeah, he does say that as well. This guy's really unhappy, guys. And it's really funny. I, I don't think... I've gone back and forth on whether I think the Imagineers knew they were writing a depressed character. I think they... Or if they this is just what it was like back in the, back in the day. Because mm. there was a lot of that, like, oh, ball and chain humor mm. back in, like, in this era. Yeah. But it doesn't feel like... The, the, the characters are making jokes, but it doesn't feel like the situation itself is a joke. No. It feels very real. You know what it reminds me a bit of? You know, like, when um, families go on vacation to Disney World and the dad wears, like, a shirt that's, like, most expensive shirt uh, trip ever. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Or, you know, like, uh, you know, she's wearing one, like, he's my Prince Charming, and then his is, like, I'm the bank account. It yeah, just feels like ridiculous. one of those, that sort of humor of... I hate my family. I hate my wife. Why am I here? Also, it doesn't help that it's being delivered coldly by robots too, which mm. kind of like maybe there could be some charm to these lines, but Oh, there is charm. But but <laughs> you're seeing it on the cold face of an animatronic just saying, Cheer up, Sarah. Let's all sing for Sarah. So she I don't okay, so that that was another good I wanted to bring up was and I guess this is a question for you guys is <laughs> Do you feel like you connect with these characters if they were 2024 projections or more so with these 1960s or early 1970s animatronics? Define connect. <laughs> like, do, do you feel like, I swear I'm not on drugs right now, yeah, but I mean, I think I sit, is. I'm on Benadryl. I think uh, when I sit there long enough in that show, for whatever reason, like, yes, I know they're like, like you, I feel like they're just like people in the room. Oh, yeah. Yeah, for it's sure. It's not like I'm like looking at like, oh, that's a real like, but somehow no, you, you I believe you them. get emotionally attached to Yeah. I'm these. not sure I like them, but I mm -hmm. do care for them. And I think mm -hmm. that's actually, I mean, it's proven by the fact that we're having this conversation about the rich backstory of this father being mm -hmm. a depressed alcoholic. And there's very few uh theme park attractions you could say this level of detail about. Like, think about like really good attractions, but like Pirates of the Caribbean. Sure, like fans have come up with this lore about the redhead or whatever, but it's it's fan theory. Well, this is the actual text is these are character traits we are finding within it. I think I could buy the idea that the Imagineers knew, like, okay, we're gonna have three, four scenes that are going to showcase different eras of time. Mm. Wouldn't it be funny if in the backstory, mm. we just weave this idea that this father is slowly getting unhappy? <laughs> yeah. I, I think it's one of those things It's like, we've got to write it in a way that gets past the sponsor. Yeah. But they were like, I'm going to write it in very, very subtly. Um, in a way, I think it almost, you know how when uh, the Imagineers were developing Epcot and the hidden Mickeys were actually like, 
intentionally they were told not to include Disney characters, so they did it as a bit of a fuck you yeah. to the interruption, like you can't include Mickey Mouse, so they start hiding everywhere. I think it's one of those things where they got told this has to show how amazing technology is. And whoever was writing the script was just there being like, mm. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna get you in trouble in a couple of decades. May, maybe going through it himself. Perhaps yeah. Yeah, it's like George it's, semi-autobiographical. Yeah, it's like maybe. George Lucas writing Temple of Doom when mm. he was going through a divorce. You could very much see it if you watched that film. Really? And then we move to the new scene, the 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 early 2000s, turn of the century, 21st century here. Uh, starts with Carol of the Bells, a jam. Isn't it a pleasant holiday? I don't know, turkey's in the oven, it's peaceful and quiet. Yes! 300 points, my best score yet. And then uh, oh, the grandpa, I wrote down the grandpa's a sad man too. You can see where the dad gets it. I think one of the first things he says is they're talking about the refrigerator being able to, you could talk to the refrigerator and tell it to do things. Mm. And he says, great, tell the refrigerator to bring me a root beer, which is like, he's asking for a cold one. He's not. Do you, do you think there's a generational trauma going on here? Oh, I think so for sure. Do you think uh, Jimmy is going to break it? Little Jimmy. He's got to have to break out of that building. He's been spinning around that carousel for God knows yeah, how many years. Yeah, just at, looking at that lady <laughs> in those funny little goggles. Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting thing to bring up. It's him inheriting the, the same prejudices of his dad. Maybe that's why it's in there. That's why it is really funny when the family roasts the dad for being a big uh, bad cook, mm. when he can't cook a turkey every Christmas. Mm. The, one of the things when he ruins the turkey in, in the final scenes, uh, Sarah says, Oh! Another Christmas turkey ruined. She doesn't say anything else, but just oh, another Christmas fucked up by you. And we're all just like you said, sitting there kind of like awkwardly being like, all right, mm -hmm. chill, I guess. He also has a shirt on that says my food rocks. So like this guy, he just doesn't have the respect of his yeah. family, I think. No, I don't think so. But that gag with him saying the numbers is genuinely really funny. Like it gets a little little giggle out of me every time. Which one? That when when he, he keeps being like five hundred and four, and the oh, yeah. temperature keeps changing. Take that, you nincompoop! Hey, check it out, Dad. Grandma's up to nine hundred and seventy-five points. Wow, nine hundred and seventy-five. Temperature increase to nine seven five. Yeah, yeah, it's it, it builds really well. Uh, also, when you have a shirt that says "My food rocks." Almost ninety nine percent of the time, your food doesn't wrong. Like Michael Scott having world's best mm, bot on yeah. a boss on yeah. his uh, on his mug. Yeah. Is there any other goods we missed? Because that's actually the end of my goods. Here. I mean, I think we very thoroughly covered the ride. Yeah. I can't really think of anything else. I'll just put the button and then like grandma slaying on the VR Ugh, game. Pretty funny, murderous. Yeah. She's a murderous lady. Just, yeah. Anyways, uh, moving on to these bads, I just want to point out up top, a lot of the stuff we said about the relationship <laughs> of these characters probably could be seen as a bad. I think it's very funny. Um, yeah. Therefore, I think it's a good. I think we could have, we could have just repeat the exactly what we just said there, but in a slightly different tone, and it would work perfectly. I think it's hilarious that they chose to make this guy really unhappy. <laughs> yeah. I think if you want Disney World to just be happy all the time, yeah. that's a bad thing. But I feel like we are connoisseurs of theme parks, yeah. sickos. We we want the 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 reality. We want the grit. We want the drama. Especially if you're like pushing like a very cookie cutter happy. There's a great big beautiful tomorrow song, mm. and then the undercurrent of that is this relationship that's on the rocks and is eroding over time. Yeah. It's symbolic of progress, having you know roadblocks and mm. having some you know some trials and tribulations, casualties. <laughs> mm. But there are some lines in here that are like overtly just like, damn, they pushed it. Okay. The, I forgot after he says yes Sarah <laughs> then Rover barks or something and he goes Rover don't interrupt while Sarah is interrupting <laughs> <laughs> Rover don't interrupt while Sarah is interrupting wait that's in the bad section it's in the bad I think I think it's a I mean I feel bad for her but in a do you think it pushes it too far? I think it went a little too far the other ones were a little more under like under like you know under the vest mm. this one I don't know I don't know, man. That one's pretty close. It makes me wonder about the writer, but <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. And also, I think in general, and this is actually this is a bad for me. Mm. I think in general, when they make an overt joke, they're not that funny. When they're actually writing for something to be a joke and not for it to be unintentionally funny, right? Like for example, uh, there's this part where uh, Patricia is talking. She's saying, "I don't want to go out in the Statue of Liberty costume that right. Mom made me," and then he says something along the lines of, "Like, well, if the guy doesn't like you uh, because of that costume, maybe you could just continue holding that torch for him." And I'm just that, that that's like mm. an example of like, I think it works because he's a dad. He's and a it dad. Sounds like it's, a dad joke. It's dad jokes. Yeah. 
but um, not nearly as funny as don't interrupt me while Sarah's interrupting me. But you put that on your bad list. It's pretty funny and it's bad, but it's a bad, you have to acknowledge it's a bad thing. Okay. Anyways, uh, the future scene. I have it as bad. I don't like it. I somewhat agree. I, in the sense of, I think they either need to make the decision to update it and make it futuristic or just theme it to like 2000. Do you want to hear some of the things they refer to as the future? Yeah, go for it. Because you could tell they changed the clothes. They didn't change the dialogue because it would be too expensive. Yeah. They still reference car phone, mm. laser discs, high def TV. Mm. Mm, that's the one that always jars for me the most. High definition TV. Yeah. It's, 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 I think it's the fact they don't even say HD. No, they say <laughs> high def. Yeah. <laughs> you know, in my day. Oh, no. You're not going to tell us about the old days when you didn't even have a car phone. Hey, Trish. For a while, we didn't even have a house phone. Not to mention laser discs and high def TV. To be fair, the car phone thing is re- references as a historical thing. That's fair. Yeah, he yeah. doesn't even have a car phone. Kind yeah, of thing. yeah, like you know, yeah. but no but it still feels weird to say. No one, no, no one's walking around saying that nowadays. No, no he doesn't even have a car phone. Well, I mean, I am, but only because I'm quoting this attraction. Fair enough. Yeah, I, I just think they could update this scene, and I think so much of the scene is derailed by the VR headset. Yeah. And this is also maybe just a leak in of my disdain for VR in general. Yeah. But like so much of that scene is dominated by these two idiots with their headsets on. Yeah, it's a bit loud as well. Yeah. The the, the sound of the VR thing. I do like, as I mentioned before, the gag of the high scores setting the phone off. But apart from that, I do find it a bit distracting. It's a bit distracting. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, I would like them to update this last scene. But if it meant changing the previous three scenes. No, no, they can't touch it. 100% not because, you know, they would tone it down. There's a quiet, refined nature to the old, older scenes mm. where they really do almost feel like a stage play. Yeah. Whereas this new scene feels like, feels like what they were going for with tomorrow, uh, a fucking Tomorrowland. Yeah. Where it was like, oh, we're gonna go for this, we're gonna try and hit this impossible moving target, where something is going to be from the future and nothing could ever be in the future forever. Yeah. I mean, it'd be interesting because they're already framing it as Walt Disney's Carousel of Progress to reinstate the last scene to the 60s. Mm-hmm. So it is the original version of it. That could be a good way of making it feel like instead of being in that weird no man's land where it's kind of the original, but kind of not. I feel like I would do one of two things. You either bite the bullet and update it or go to 1960s. Yeah, That's one thing. They just get such a fat gap. Mm. Oh, dude, Between I... 40s and like... <laughs> yeah, but that could be funny. Uh-huh. You know, it'd be really funny. It'd be super metal and bleak. Yeah. And they should just replace this scene with today's modern version, mm. except they could save money by literally just having all these characters in the same room, except they all just have phones and they're just looking at their phones and they don't say a word <laughs> for 30 seconds. And then the music just starts playing. How fucking metal would that be? It would be like this crazy meditation on on today. And it's like, and here's today, the 2020s, where we now have computers in our hands. And it just cuts <laughs> to all of them just silently scrolling. Yeah. I love that so much. And then the song plays, they don't even pick their head up. Yeah, it like great? plays out of like one of their speakers by accident. Maybe the sister looks up and goes, Alexa, turn off the music. Oh. <laughs> right back down i really like that that would be it would be such a great contrast to the rest of it so it, it just cuts it. off the music and then all you hear is that track Silence. and the wheel just the, just rolling. The, <laughs> just rolling out all right <laughs> enjoy today uh i think that would make headlines okay bob Iger, this is this guy this it's, is a great it's a, idea it's a genius idea uh i i think you should do it i think people would dig you know who would love that idea gen z they'd be yeah. like finally Disney taking on the idea that we need to be more connected. We feel seen. <laughs> yeah, uh, they they would never say that. Uh, the the doors could be Disney. doing like a TikTok dance in the background. Yeah. Like, <laughs> the son could be like a Fortnite gamer. They could it, just really go ham with that. No, yeah, I, I I don't think people buy satire when it comes from like a major corporation like Disney. But it could they could take the swing. I would appreciate the swing. Yeah. Uh, do you have any? Actually, you know what? I I I you know I I know I teased you having to defend this ride, but really I don't have a lot of bads here. No, I, I the thing I would agree with is that final scene doesn't quite fit with the rest of it. I totally agree on that. To be honest, I can't really think of any other bad things about it. I think it does what it intends to do really well. Yeah, and I also agree. I totally agree. Might do a lot of stuff it doesn't intend to do really well. At the same time. I think that's the best part about it. It's yeah. got this room like quality where like they didn't intentionally mm-hmm. make the room to be bad. Yeah, uh, comparing it to the room feels oh, a yeah. bit. I just did. 
I just did. Mm-hmm. I think there was a lot of things that happened in the dialogue here. There's no way they knew what they were doing. Like, I, I just can't. I can't see them taking the risk of thinking it'd be hilarious to put this subplot of this unhappy family. Yeah. I mean, I'm strong proponent of Death of the Author. So to me, it's irrelevant whether they intended it or not. Fair if enough. we find this story in it, yeah. therefore it is there. I mean, I don't know how you couldn't see it. Yeah. Yeah. Like the first time I watched it, I was just like, that was a bit weird, right? And yeah. then we got forced to watch it a second time. Yeah, this is it. And I was like, no, yeah, that definitely was weird. And, and that's, that's a great attraction when it has richness and layers that you can, if you're forced to write it twice in I a row. I was forced to write it two times in a row. Yeah. You wouldn't have that on, I'm trying to name attraction, but I feel like I'm going to get in trouble whichever one I raise here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, exactly. Yeah. I love all theme park attractions, Disney fans. Yeah, the the, yeah. the I mean, Little Mermaid ride. If you did that twice in a row, you wouldn't find anything on the second one. I don't think that's got any hardcore fans. I don't think that's true. This, this couldn't. This wouldn't be made today. Nothing like this. Can no, be made nothing today. would be made like this. So I guess that would be a bad if it got replaced. Then that would be. Well, we'll get into we'll that in the world class yeah. test. Which I will we, say. I will say a bad is that you don't have this at Disneyland anymore. You just have like a waste of space. I don't I remember if it's the launch bay anymore. I think it's it Star might Wars be launch bay. I think it might think be so. like an area now for like DVC to yeah, hang I think out. It's, DVC now. it's anyway. a huge building. It's such a fucking waste it's of space. It's a waste of space, but it might be going anyway with the rumors of possibly a Pandora. Maybe. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, at least with the Carousel Progress, it left Disneyland because it physically moved to Magic Kingdom. They didn't get rid yeah. of it. So it's not quite it's the same as just like ditching it. Yeah. I wonder if they'll ever get rid of Tomorrowland. Well, the whole land. The whole land. Yeah. Other than Space Mountain. They'd keep Space Mountain. Yeah. I mean, in Tokyo, they're, they're, they're yep. rebuilding Space Mountain. I saw that. Yeah. yeah. It's a lot. Yeah. So. I think did they, they, they might have just finally closed it, maybe? Or no, it's got a little bit longer. Yeah. It's definitely soon if they haven't already. I think it's sometime this year, I think. They're yeah. closing it. And then it's like, what, 20? Oh, it's a long time. It's like a few years at yeah. least. And then, but that's some interesting concept art. I'm I don't excited know if you've for seen that. that I'll have to get down there. Uh, either way, if we're done with the bads, let's move on to the world-class tests. But before we do that, let's once again have a word from our sponsors. All right. Thank you for sponsoring and supporting this show. Let's get into the world-class tests. This is a rubric of 10 tests painstakingly devised by Byron and myself to determine if an attraction is world-class. To receive the highly coveted world-class pass, the attraction must pass 7 out of 10 tests. A score of 6 out of 10 leaves the attraction up for debate for world-class pass standing, and anything lower than 6 out of 10 is an automatic fail. I am fascinated to see how this one does. Uh, I'm scared. I can. I feel nervous oh, right now. I, I can see you're going to try and wiggle some through, and you know what? You got the goal line defense over here. I'm no yeah. longer the guy that's going to... I'm going to protect the sanctity and the reputation of this show. I mean, the, the, <laughs> the emotional stakes are high for me. I've, I've laid down that this is important mm-hmm. to the... To the from the party family, so which is our a legal surname, by the way. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Let's start off with the first test: the the average tourist test. Would the average tourist have a hard time getting on this ride? Is there a long wait? Is there a complicated queue system? Did you mention how much the average wait time was was of this ride? No, I didn't even bother uh, bringing <laughs> it up for this attraction because there it's really be like zero. Is, there is no wait for this attraction. No, so. <laughs> yeah, it's it's non-existent. You could pretty much walk on this anytime. It's like great moments with Mr. Lincoln. It's basically just you're waiting for the show to start. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, this is the easiest possible, I imagine, out of all of these. <laughs> I mean, I'm trying to think of how a tourist could not get on it. They'd have to be not able to see the sign, not know the building's there. It's a it's, big building. It's right next to Space Mountain. That's a very good point. So are you, do they stop? Do they load people? Like, let's say the first scene goes, it rotates over. Do they then load people in yeah. on the other? So, so it's actually divided into five, isn't it? And one's I the, think it's six. Or is it actually six? I think it's six. There's, an, there's a load and there's an unload, oh, I, know, I think. Both of those. Wow. Oh, wow. Four acts and then six actual uh, yeah. theaters. Because mm. I was going to say, I, I, I guess if you got there and the show had just started, you have, you're looking at a 20-minute wait. But then I realized, no, they're loading people in scene by scene. So It's like four. Man, that's crazy. That's actually pretty impressive, especially because you don't really get a lot of bleed through the walls no. in terms of sound. But what do we think here? I mean, this is a clear pass for me. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah it's about <laughs> I, I can't think of how anyone could conceivably not give that a pass. Yeah, no, it's, I it's, mean, they built they built this attraction in the 60s with the intentions of it handling an insane amount of people and it's at does. the World's Fair. 
was one of the most like popular pavilions at the World's Fair. And still, I think some people say it was like consistently over an hour. I've heard other reports that it's like sometimes it got to an hour. But to have a like a ride with that amount of demand, like yeah. first coming out at like on like a world stage like that and still like topping out at around an hour is insane. Yeah, it's not that bad a wait. Like that, Radio Springs Races was worse pretty much the whole time I was in Disneyland last week. Yeah. Well, that's a tough one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is not the case. Like, no, it, no. It's, th this is uh, the only thing I could ha like say would be like a detriment to this in the test is that it is like over 20 minutes of your time. And maybe the average tourist is like, but actually the they average tourist that. doesn't know it's yeah, 20 minutes trapped. when they get in. They think it's, no, they, they, think they, might be, <laughs> they might think like, is this the They won't have a ride? hard time getting on this ride. They'll have a hard time getting off it. Yeah, especially, especially if they, yeah, especially yeah. they stop it and they have to do it. Dude, that was a 40 minute ordeal. <laughs> being trapped in the carousel of progress. Yeah. Uh, and the irony of being trapped in a place called the carousel of progress. Yeah, so that's uh, a pass. Uh, pass. Moving on to test number two. That's one for one. The Leslie Stahl test. Would you be willing to wait 60 minutes for this attraction if you've already been on it at least once? Or how we've been framing it lately, if every ride was 60 minutes long in terms of wait in the park, would you wait 60 for this? I would. And you're here's ready? my ras rationale. Oh, right. just, just, that you're flying in from the UK. Well, that, I think sometimes that you, I think locals perceive attractions in a different way to international visitors do because there's some, like, a coaster, for example, is one that you, you're always going to hit up if you're a local. Yeah. But there's certain attractions that I think hit better if you're doing them every three years. But the other thing I'd bring up is, I know we mentioned it being 20 minutes, is that a bad thing? But Q to ride ratio, really yeah. high on this. Because this is how I felt on Rise of the Resistance last week, is I queued 45 minutes, but then the entire experience is a solid 20. Yeah. Um, yeah. And Carousel Progress is an equivalent to that, that you, you're queuing an hour for a 20-minute experience. That is efficient use of time. But what if you're not enjoying the ride and you feel like it's a cue? Well, that's tasteless. <laughs> that's not my problem. <laughs> I imagine, no, I'm not saying that's me, but I bet you there's a, a like an unsuspecting tourist that wanders in here and it's like, oh, no, wait. Yeah. But what the fuck is this? <laughs> this guy's I, oven is talking. But that's not relevant to the question. I and. guess that's true. I, I, oh boy, you're will. So you're saying 60 minutes in line. Yeah. Plus roughly around, let's call it 25 to 30 minutes when you count like load, unload. Mm-hmm. Mm you're spending a feature film's length mm. on your day at Disneyland or at the Magic Kingdom on Carousel of Progress. Yeah. A park with many hour-long lines on a daily basis. But, but also, think about it this way, that it is Magic Kingdom's premier attraction if you look at it from <laughs> an international perspective. It is a juicy exclusive. It is, it is the only juicy exclusive in the park, isn't it? Oh I mean, God. maybe there's some other... Oh, Hall of Presidents, but we don't... No, we don't talk about Hall of Presidents. No. Uh, um, so, I mean, I mean, maybe you guys will do an episode on that. No. That, that'd be fun. I'm intrigued. Uh, I'm um, intrigued. <laughs> yeah, I'll come back for that. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, apart from the Hall of Presidents, this is the... If, if Magic Kingdom got, like, wiped from the face of the planet, this would be the biggest loss to, like, the culture. Because everything else is in a different Disney park. That's true. Not it, people it, it is his, history. That's why um, I don't think it's going to go anywhere. Yeah, not people move it. But this is this is more important than people move it, in my opinion. I don't know about that. That I mean, it's good. It's yeah. uh, I. You know my issue with the people move. Oh no, I'm really going to get cancelled here. I wish it dropped you off somewhere, and you can. It was a form of transport. I don't like it drops you off in the same place you started. It should drop you off on actually, Space Mountain. I think that's not, that's actually a pretty decent take. Yeah, that's like the Hogwarts Express at Universal. I love it just because it's actually efficient transport and a ride. It's like the dream. The monorail, I love it because of that. And that's my issue with the people movers. I wish it took you to like, I don't know, Main Street or something. It should be like the railroad where you could ride yeah, it all the way through. Yeah. And, or you could get off at certain stops. That's yeah. fair. And they also kind of play on that. Like they call it like the blue line or something like that. Yeah. So it should do that. Yeah. This is the thing. I, I live in a city, London, that has good public transport. That's so fair. the fantasy of public transport is less exciting. Yeah. Yeah. It's very, it's very much a fantasy here in LA. Yeah. Uh, very, I, very jealous of the underground. Here, I, huh? I, I can't say I'd wait 60 for this. I don't really have any reasons other than, but, like, obviously. <laughs> but if every other attraction was at 60, because okay. tactically, obviously, in the real world, it doesn't make sense because it's already yeah. past number one with flying colors. Yeah. This is like a theoretical situation where I would rather wait 60 for this than Big Thunder Mountain. That's insane. Uh, I don't think, okay, I'm going big thunder over this. I'd wait for Haunted Mansion over this. If yeah, we're going to Magic Kingdom, I would wait for... <laughs> would you wait for their pirates over this? 
considering I such an yeah, honestly version. i don't know if i'd wait for bad pirates over this i probably would wait for tiana's when it comes out i would wait well for, you might it might be terrible we don't know we don't know but we, i'll wait for tron i've not done Sp- it so i can't say space mountain i'd wait for those five there's mm. no way <laughs> there's, we're already running out of time in the park you know by myself Ooh, it'd have to be like a really right circumstances. If I take a group of people and wait 60 minutes for this, I'm getting thrown in the seven seas lagoon after. Like, yeah, there's, there's no way they're, they're going to like, kill me. You, like, me. you just made us dedicate an hour and a half. A tight yeah. 90. No, in a, I think people would thank you after that. They'd be like, you no, showed us the light. <laughs> they would not. Maybe, 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 maybe. You've you got to go with the right people. If you took a pack of weirdos, mm-hmm. but if you took like, your non-park head friends to this place and you're like we gotta wait 60 for this i think it'd be a good friendship test do i want these people in my life that's what you're basing your friendships off of yes. whether or not people are willing to wait 60 for well afterwards if they... hey you may realize you have loyal friends out of it yeah but like that doesn't mean that they're gonna like it i mean i think i think my friends have really excellent taste and would love this i think it's a great show i just don't think i'd wait 60 for it i just can't in good conscience say i would okay. i'm 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 gonna fail here oh uh, no <laughs> sorry <laughs> i tried oh he did try he did try i respect the effort one for two very valiant smartphone test test number three does the cue of this ride have enough to keep you off of your phone this is an interesting question because there's not really a cue but there's also not really a line Okay, so I want to um, evoke oh, a precedence on the on okay, this podcast. Here we go. Oh, episode God. ten. Oh my Shame God! Shame he passes the people rec- mover on the, rec- the basis of the three sixty views of tomorrow night from the queue line. <laughs> I would like to evoke said defense in order to pass Carousel of Progress. And if you don't, this is biased towards your friend. That's true. I still think people mover should have failed. Yeah, uh, but you know, no, but this is it's legal precedence. But, if you want integrity on this show, but hmm. I have said that if I could go back, I would change it to a fail. On the on the people mover episode, I think this is biased towards your friend. If you don't pass me on this, I, I think I think it would be discriminatory against someone who's flown from another country oh my God. to be on this podcast and no other reason. Yeah, I. Well, here's the big difference: the people mover actually does get a line. Mm. <laughs> it like it it will often be a fifteen to thirty minute wait okay. in which you do have to sit in those like just standard chains of switchbacks. Mm. Um, where Carousel of Progress, you don't wait at all. The only time you're waiting for Carousel of Progress, you're getting that that Stoke video of Walt oh, Disney yeah. and the guy with the harness on. Yeah, that's true. And you're getting you're getting the, you're basically getting like kind of this museum esque like history into the attraction to get you all stoked before you get in. And then like within a matter of four or five minutes, they are letting you into the show. So it does for me have enough to keep me off my phone. I don't even think you're going to have any time to even look at your phone. <laughs> and if you do have a few minutes, you're going to be, uh, you know, looking as, at Tomorrowland. Well, either so, Tomorrowland or, or learning or getting the context, especially yeah. if you haven't experienced That's the attraction before. So I would give this a pass. People mover is still a fail for me, but this is, I would okay. say, a pass. Cool. Well, then, you know, it passed already. So it doesn't matter what I think, you know, I yeah, guess, uh, I actually think though having that little lobby video of like seeing that for what the line is, which is usually around five minutes, you you could probably pass it. Yep. Yeah. All right. That's fair. I can't believe you pulled out the receipts. That's very funny. <laughs> I'm I'm here to win. <laughs> <laughs> All right, two for three. You're on what your way. Test number four, the Tony Stark test. How innovative is this attraction? Does it push theme park tech forward? 100%. Um, I, and, I, and I've got receipts for this as well. I'd you don't love believe to hear so. them. Because- okay. So first, the ride system was used two, two more times for American Sings in Disneyland and Meet the World in Tokyo Disneyland, where the stages were reversed, that you sat on the inside. Yeah. And then the mm-hmm. stage, so the ride system itself. And then I'd also argue it paves the way for Pirates of the Caribbean, because that's basically, from a tech perspective, combining two World's Fair innovations. You're taking the boat ride of It's a Small World and the more complex animatronics of Carousel of Progress and Great Moments with Mr. Lincoln. So without this attraction, I don't think you could have Pirates of the Caribbean. And then also, thirdly, I think a lot of the original Epcot rides are really inspired by this more show style of ride. So stuff like Horizons, stuff like Universe of Energy. I think you could even argue that Tokyo's Beauty and the Beast ride is somewhat inspired by the the pacing of this, that you're moving from room to room and watching a show. So I can't see any reason why not. (laughs) (laughs) I'm thinking. that's how Try and come up with a counter argument. I mean, those are all really good points. I will say... Because innovative for the time, right? That's the question. And you know what's crazy, too, is you didn't even bring up the one thing I would have thought you were going to lean into, oh. which is the fact that 
the the idea of a rotating theater is insane. It's never oh, yeah. been, that, that had never been done before. And yeah. you could see that kind of carousel model being mimicked even in the rides like Forbidden Journey. Mm, when you like when you fly yeah. into a rotating mm-hmm. carousel. That's a really good point. Or the turntable sequence in uh, the original version of Journey into Imagination. Yeah. Or, or Smuggler's Run is technically doing that, right? That is you a turn. Yeah, that is a turn table. also has a turntable as well. Which bit? Uh, when you yeah, when you get into the transport vehicle, yeah, that oh, tricks you into that's thinking. how you open up and it like it's the same door. Oh, is that as how it does that? Walked in. I didn't. I was just mm-hmm. so stunned by that. That's I didn't. I avoided watching any videos. Oh, of that, dude, so. I, I couldn't. I I wish I could experience that moment again for the first time. Yeah. I have to say, paired with that argument as well as just the carousel never being done before, it's re- it really is a feat to do move that many. What do you say? Like more? No, like the most. It's been like it's the most viewed, most watched show in American theater. Is that the exact line? It's, they use? it's the lo- America's longest standing play, and also more performances than any other play in American history. Yeah, yeah. Like, and I, th- I do feel like this model, the and the innovation that went into getting this many people to experience it mm. in such a short amount of time, had to have gotten, you know, theme park creatives to rethink how we can perform shows efficiently yeah. in theme parks. Also, I believe the programming of the animatronics was also pretty revolutionary in this one. Oh yeah. I, I don't the way for pirates. <sighs> Fuck. Yeah. You know, I mean, I'm just trying to not get overwhelmed by the data and trying to think if I could keep, uh, if I could come up with a counter argument on the spot, but really I can't think of one because, because I'm right. I mean, they're <laughs> old, they're old animatronics now, but they did start there. The context, yeah. the historical context, like we were talking about exactly. before, it does come into play here. I think oh, yeah. in terms of innovation itself is a definite pass. Um, I agree. And that's the test. That is the test. Yeah, if that's... we're going by the mark of the test. Yeah. I was just trying to think like if theme park tech forward, I still think it takes theme park tech I do forward. Think so as Even well. if it's not done in this exact carousel way. Well, it's still standing. Um, it's still doing it the exact same way. It's pretty yeah. close to the 1964 world's fair. Version. And, it, and it still is the standard, I think. Well, that's another pass then three for four. I, we're pretty close. We're, we're getting there. <laughs> test number five, the Hollywood test. Can Oh, here we go. Can this attraction be adapted for the silver screen? Does it have a comprehensible story? I don't you know, think there's any way we could say no based off all the good stuff we were saying about this. You could 100% adapt this. <laughs> I don't know. If you, <laughs> I don't know what the... Would the movie then be just following a family through... Yeah. And and I have ideas for how this could be executed. I'd love to so hear. So I think I was trying to think who I would cast as John because you need someone with gravitas, someone with weight. Yeah. And I actually did a bit of googling. Someone has expressed interest. Jamie Lee Curtis says she'd do it. So this is the quote. So my favorite ride attraction was something called the Carousel of Progress, which is only now at Disney World. Uh, but it was the GE Carousel of Progress, and I loved it. So I'd want to make a movie of the Carousel of Progress, which is basically time travel. It's sort of about technology and how it's changed over the years. So that's what I would do. So we have an interested A-lister. We have a great premise. We could gender swap it. So it's like maybe a little bit more like to the times. Yeah. That, that doesn't feel quite as like sexist if yeah. she's the one, you know, pressing the sort of the husband yeah. unless you want to make it like a joke of itself like the the night um, evite i just don't think i think it'd go over too many people's heads unfortunately well, no, it could, it, the the walt disney company have never won a best picture oscar so this uh-huh. could be their chance and they could get someone like scissor to sing carousel of progress in like an r&b way over the credits can you not see my vision here i could kind of see it i uh, i mean it's basically a play i would say this there's more richness to adapt here than any other theme park to movie adaption has actually taken place in my opinion well maybe not pirates um the, the thing where i'm struggling though is like half of my good section was about how bad the thing they're portraying is <laughs> in the sense of like yeah. they are portraying this very sexist kind of role that we are seeing play out in front of us i think it's funny as hell because but they doesn't it evoke an emotion it does evoke an emotion but i don't it's just because i don't think they understood what they were doing and i think that's hilarious that they didn't understand mm. that which could be very much a bad thing. But, it could be, I it's mean, like pretty much a good bad. They're like I mean, the same results thing. are results. If, if they can make a movie of the Jungle Cruise, they can make a movie of this. I just don't know. The story is like they're literally going through different eras. Yeah. Compre- I mean, I've got a star. I've got a premise. I've got, I've got someone to cre- <laughs> sing the credit song. That would, that would slap on Spotify. It would do numbers. Maybe it would. Yeah. I don't know. You know what? Make this a musical and I'm in. Okay, deal. Oh fuck! A musical would be really good. I think you could. Yeah, I think you could. I think yeah. they have like. Is any Sherman still alive? We could bring them in. No, if not, I don't think okay, Lin Manuel. We'll get him on the phone. 
I think you need a better ending than just burning the turkey, but... Yeah, but you could build. The whole house could set on fire. There is a story mm. at play between the family members beyond just delivering exposition. Jesus Christ, I guess. I guess. I think it's a pass. <laughs> 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 I think you've made some great points. Oh, my God. And I would love to see a musical. Oh, yeah. my God. I think I would. I would be singing musical. Great Big I'd Beautiful like Lee, tomorrow out of, the, uh, out of the theater. Yeah. All right, fuck it. Let's pass it. Four out of five. This is unbelievable. <laughs> There's no way. All right, four out of five. Moving on to test number six, the Simpson test. How likely is this ride to be replaced with something new? You know what? <laughs> this might be a stretch, but why haven't they replaced it already? I think because they just haven't found something that would be worth taking over the footprint. It's not that big of a footprint in the grand scheme of things. Yeah. I think it's a bit of an awkward shaped building. It's a bit of an awkward sized building. Yes. So even though as you know in in the in the magic kingdom attraction lineup i can see why they would ditch it if i was disney corporate but they they haven't bothered to yet and i i think it's just safe just because it's a bit awkward i've thought of an idea since being here because you were saying like 20s era um 40s era i just suddenly thought they should put a taylor swift eras tour into the oh theater my God, dude. that would do numbers it would definitely do numbers yeah. would that be a good thing yeah i don't know it would be would it be like a musion effect taylor swift yeah and then you could have like audio animatronic snakes and stuff when it's in reputation look you could have I, a little cottage for folklore i love taylor swift but i'm telling you right now that would piss people off oh it would <laughs> it wouldn't when, be furious yeah but what it would do is it would be the best of both worlds for me because i'm a swifty so i'd like to see that but also suddenly carousel of progress would become one of those rides that suddenly everyone's defending yeah. and everyone being like it was so good i loved it so much oh i see the martyr it yeah become so become martyr. a martyr and at the same time we get because people have pitched Taylor Swift Rock and Roller Coaster, but that wouldn't work because it's the wrong pace. You would want something that's well, a bit more theatrical. There, wasn't there like rumors of a Jonas Brothers Rock and Roller Coaster at one oh, point? No. That was in the discussion. Yeah. I think Rock and or Roller Coaster. Muppets. Would, I don't know if that's the right pace one. either, though. The yeah. I think got some rockier stuff, I guess. I guess that's true. Yeah. Um, I, what I think would be cool with Rock and Roller Coaster is make it like a residency, like switch it out every six months. Mm -hmm. Like whoever's the hot flavor of the month, put them yeah. in there. Why not? Mm. <sighs> I just. I could see this being replaced. I hate to say it. I really think they would. But then again, maybe they wouldn't. It's it's a historical attraction. It's it's, it's one of the few remaining that Walt actually touched in Walt Disney World. It is Walt America's Disney's. longest standing play. Mm. I And when the movie comes out, they'll want to keep it to tie in. So I can't believe we passed the movie test. I'm just like remember we I can I think I think I think it's a fair pass on the movie test. However, for this one I think it all boils down to butts and seats. It doesn't matter how classic or historical it is. I mean, also, you know, same year, Space Mountain right next to it. That's still getting hour plus waits on a daily basis. This yeah. theater is never full, even like on relatively crowded days. And that's a lot of square footage for not enough butts in the seats. And as soon as they find something to replace it, I think they're going to replace I it. Think, so. I actually think I might agree. Mm -hmm. I think and from you looking at, it, looking at it from a spreadsheet perspective... It is not getting the job done. Mm -hmm. uh, you know what? I actually genuinely agree with you guys on this one. I wanted to try it. <laughs> <laughs> you did, did, did preface it by saying it was a stretch. What well, yeah. was that? The Hollywood version? No, 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 no. The Hollywood one, I 100 You believe. were really behind that one. Yeah, so. no, yeah. yeah. All right, we're going to sure. fail it then. Yeah. Four for six. Moving on to, I mean, I hope we're wrong on that one, honestly. Yeah, same. Uh, test number seven, the signature moment test. Can the ride hold its own without its signature moment? Is it a one trick pony? I would say the signature moment is anytime they sing the song. I think it's the movement from room to room in combination with that. Mm, um, yeah. And I would agree. I think if it, if you imagine you went on it and it broke, but not in the way it broke for you and they just made you walk from room to room and sit down, I think it would still work for what it is. It would just be less efficient and less pacey. Would you like the show still if they had no song? Yeah, I would like it less, but the song isn't the 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 core of it. I don't think so either. I actually, I actually agree. I think if the song was gone, I wouldn't mind it. I just think I'm I'm there for this horrible dad because mm. he's just. Oh, if they took him out, then I would like. If they took him out, now I'm having some issues because yeah. now there's nothing funny about this ride to me. But I don't think it's a signature moment. The main character. <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, I think. Uh, I think yeah, the song and the rotation. R losing the rotating carousel would be tough. If the mm. carousel doesn't carousel. They yeah, that's tough though. That's like saying if the roller coaster didn't roller coaster. Yeah. 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 That's why I think the song is the only thing that's fair. Yeah. yeah that's a good point. 
And if you lose the song, I still think it's a fun show. Well, they did lose the song. They true they they put into a completely different song and it was yeah. still fine. I mean, yeah. I'm sure it still wasn't packing the house, but you know. What do you think, Byron? I mean, they got rid of the song, they had to bring it back. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right. Yeah. That's true. They, they did change the song back. <laughs> they didn't have to bring it back though. The Sherman Brothers lobbied for it. The sh- the, you know, you could hum the new song. Uh, yeah. I think it would still work without the song. I still think it would work without the song as well. I mean, I'm going to pass it. I think I'm going to pass it. I'm going to pass it. Fuck it. Yeah, we'll pass it. <laughs> that was a very begrudging pass. Five for seven. We're close to debate land. Moving on to the last three tests. But before we do that, let's have a word from our sponsors. All right. Thank you for sponsoring this episode. Let's decide this ride's fate. It needs two more to get a guaranteed pass, one more to get into debate land. Let's see what we can do. This is going to be an interesting one. Test number eight, the premature detraculation test. Does this ride finish too soon? This is weird because it's another one of those ones where some might argue it doesn't finish soon enough. Well, but that's not the question. That is not the question. I mean, I'd be tempted to say it finishes too soon. I could go There's do no a few laps. You're insane, yeah. man. <laughs> I did do two laps. Yeah, and I tell exactly. You what, it, I, I was not enjoying it as much the second time around. But I think a 21-minute attraction has a point A, point B story, as we kind of pointed out earlier. It has a message it's sending. Yeah. I. It's like a four-course meal. It's so rich. It's a very, yeah, it's a very enriching experience. Honestly, I wish it was a three course meal. <laughs> I wish it was shorter, but, yeah, but that's not the question. But the merit of the test is it, is it, is it, do you feel like you were cheated? No, I don't feel like I was cheated. <laughs> you just overindulged. I, I, I feel like I was, I, I was cheated out of maybe getting on another ride because I spent another time in an act I didn't need. That's true. That is fair. Are you talking about the future scene? No, I think you could still leave the. I think you need oh. a close, or you have to you have to change the 1940s scene oh, I love the 1940s. a little bit that it feels at least like a button, like an end. Mm. You could shorten um, things, but then that kind of takes away from the charm of it. I, I actually think this is a pretty satisfying ride. I'm very satisfied. I'm pretty satisfied. All right, well, it's a pass. All right, it's in debate. <laughs> Now you, you've accomplished your goal. No matter what, you could debate it. I mean, we still have to vote if that happens, but maybe we could get it in for sure here. Test number nine, the exit hall test. Do you see people be physically excited getting off of this ride? Do they have that bounce after they leave? Yes. <laughs> no, they don't. They do. Mind. No, they don't. That, that, that guy in the mirror. <laughs> you do, you do. I, see, I ride it with my family, and we're all coming off being like, that is a great, big, beautiful. Yeah, but you already mentioned earlier in the podcast that something you and your family watched in relation to this ride has like 122 views since you last checked. Yeah, yeah. And you I, said that the third of them was you guys. Yeah, I mean, once on my brother's birthday during lockdown, we sat down and watched a POV of it on the TV. Yeah. Because there's nothing else to do. We I'm can sure go that, outside. I can I relate to and that. And it was, it was great. I think I think people people are physically, you know, if they, if they get it, they're going to be physically moved by the experience. I actually see that most people during this, if you look around, when the song is playing, they're pretty, they look pretty annoyed. But then again, that was also when I was there when the carousel was playing it twice. Exactly. This, then we, yeah, I don't know. I, oof. I, I don't think so, man. Why wouldn't you be? <laughs> because no one looks, I can't imagine anybody leaving this and being like, hell yeah, that I, was great. I, I I'm can. full of adrenaline right now. I can't wait to go on another ride. Yeah, okay. If they increase the speed by a little bit, just like. If you could ride this ride at three times speed. Mm-hmm. Then now we're talking. Mm. They got to give you one like courtesy centrifuge spin, like for Mission Space. Yeah. You know how that ride system works. They give <laughs> give you one quick whip around, and then you got the bounce. But they don't have that, so yeah. it's a fail for me. I think it might be a fail as well. Okay, fair enough. No bounce. <laughs> he did. It. He just laid down. It was like there was no way. Was a twenty one minute stage play in Disneyland with robot actors. Come on now, that's not. There's no way. All right, that's a fail. Six for nine. Let's see if we could get it in on this tenth. The fine wine test. Has this ride aged well? Has your opinion of the attraction appreciated or depreciated since your first experience? Or if it's a new ride, do you believe it will age well? I think it's aged really well. I think it's so, it's so, it's so great now. How many years on? Like, I can't do the maths here. From the 60s. And we're still talking about it. We're still discussing it. We're still dissecting it. We are. That's, I can't see how it hasn't aged well for what it is. It, it feels like a product from another time, but it doesn't feel the entertainment value is still there. I have some counter arguments. <laughs> First one is the future scene 
literally has not aged well and that they're talking about laser discs okay and, and hd television okay counter argument would you say star wars has aged well because the, in my opinion if you watch star wars now the bits that have aged badly are the george lucas 1990 whatever year yeah, I don't changes know, but i don't like those bits is yeah it? yeah but that but it's got to get at least a 0. 0.75 here if it's what only if it's only the 0. <laughs> 0.25 it's failing on wait your argument there was like okay the bits that are bad in here that don't age well you know the ones in star wars mm. those i don't like either yeah and i would give star wars a 0. 0.75 on this test that okay that's one point the other point is clearly the character of the dad this dynamic that he has with his wife is very antiquated <laughs> and i think it's funny just because they didn't realize it but like at the surface it's not it's not hilarious so i feel like that in itself didn't age well i think we can look at it now through a different lens it's bringing out different <laughs> historical things i think it's really 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 aged well and to be fair i mean we are perhaps exaggerating how bad it is mm. but in terms of like that dynamic but it definitely is there i and it's set in the past the uh, the animatronics are aren't really world class what a anymore anymore yeah at least it has an animatronics. It has animatronics like they don't build all the animatronics anymore that many in one attraction it's very rare all right byron what's gonna be we've talked here it's the final act and it's it's does not that final act does not age well um and i think for me personally it's just like for the history aspect of it absolutely but for anyone else experiencing this attraction, especially that's not as obsessed about like kind of the nooks and crannies of how it was put together, I don't think the appreciation grows. As a matter of fact, I think, you know, even though I find it kind of funny, uh, some of the like kind of naivetes and like, I think a lot of people will take offense to it, especially as the years go on. Yeah. yeah. I don't think they're going <laughs> to, I don't think they're going to like look at it the same way I do, where it's like almost seems like he's making a joke of himself yeah. without realizing it. Yeah. Um, so I think for a lot of people, it will not age well. It'll continue to not age well. Uh, so I would give it a fail. Oh, shit. <laughs> I'm guessing you're going to give it a pass. All right. I've done it to myself again. Um, <laughs> Welcome back. I just gotta think a second. Let me just think. Okay. I just think I the thing is I love the ride a lot. I do think it has a lot of historical value, but I think if a ride is themed on the pro carousel of progress and we haven't seen current day progress, and I know there is no way they're gonna update this ride. To me, that is the definition of not aging well. No? But the apron, the, the food <laughs> rocks. The apron. I am going to fail it, which gives it. I'm going to fail it, and that would leave it at six out of ten. Okay. And now we are in debate land. So we have to make our final piece here, and then we could either crown it or, or leave it as it is. We'll start with you. I think I think we have an idea of where you're going with this. Okay, so one thing I want to point out, because I think if I present any more arguments here, I'm not sure I'm going to win you over. So I'm just going to talk about the arguments you've presented oh during this. Oh my god. And I just want He's to talk about... Us. Yeah. <laughs> think about the good versus bad sections. How long did we talk about the good of this? It was at least 10 minutes, if not 15. How long did we talk about the bad of this? It was, what, like four minutes? To be fair, though, we... Well, I mean, it's your argument. Okay, okay. Yeah, I'm just saying... From the conversation I've had with both of you today, I cannot see how you wouldn't think this is world class based off the 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 rich, excited understanding we've had of it. The fact it's very unique. The fact that you said it was so grand, you might fail it on one of the tests. I mean, how is that not a world class attraction? It's one of a kind. It's historically important. It brings something different to Disney World that nothing else brings, and I, that's why I've heard from you both today. That's a really good point. I did also hear from you though that all those goods could have very well been bad. That's fair. As well. They could have been bad. There was almost like it was a good bad. Yeah, <laughs> it was like a combination. Yeah. It was like this a mediums. Is, but this is our opinion. Yeah, yeah. That's fair. we're not talking about someone theoretically out there who doesn't like it. Well, it could be good and bad though. I could think they're both. Yeah, yeah. It's very good, and then it makes me laugh, but it's already bad in the context of it. <laughs> so yeah. I don't. I don't. All right, fine. I'll. I'll let you off the hook. You make your vote and I'll make mine. This is the only place in the world that you can get anything remotely close to what this is. 
Yes, that is true. No other, you know, there's other rides and theme parks where it's maybe not the same exact ride, but God, the ride systems are exactly the same. They might even share the same layout, what have you. Carousel of Progress is very much linked to Walt Disney, and it does have that historical like museum aspect where I would say that the attraction is world-class. Well, then I guess it doesn't matter what I think, but for the sake of argument, if I had, if my vote was the deciding factor, I would have leaned with you as well. And you, I, I do think it's a world-class attraction. There's really nothing like it. There is, it has historical value. It's especially if you're a theme park head and, uh, I, yeah, I mean, I agree. I think it's a world-class attraction. I think it sliding into world-class consideration with six points is proper it's the first one uh it's the first one to get a world-class pass uh through the debate stage i think everyone every other one that's made it to the debate stage has not made it to world class correct i think this is, is the this first. A first for the show i think that might be you're right i think you might be right i think you got debated in yeah so are you sure ghost rider didn't get that no that was a that was a clean uh seven out of ten. Oh shit yeah well there you have it the Carousel of Progress is debatably a world-class attraction, but by the purposes of the show, it is a world-class attraction. It gets the world-class pass. Congratulations to the Carousel of Progress. We always say that. It doesn't really mean anything. But thank you again, Mike, for joining us today and for bringing a very uh, detailed ledger that you, you used to great effect. Honestly, he fought for this attraction valiantly, and uh, and I think the results speak for themselves. Um, I think it's I think it's a great attraction. I, I think with another guest, it might not have passed, and so for that, I feel very very happy with myself. Despite yeah, despite all its its misgivings and its flaws, I do think it's a it's a it's a great ride, uh, and I'm glad it's here for now. I guess before we sign off, is there anything that you would like to plug other than perhaps you go visit his his YouTube channel where he puts out great ride videos as well? Yeah, I mean that was the thing I was going to mention. Um, just type from Mike from the party into uh, YouTube. Uh, yeah, I make video essay style. Um, videos on theme park attractions. Um, I think I imagine a lot of the people who listen to your channel are uh, fans of uh, Disney. I'd say maybe one that I would point out is I did one on Flight of Passage. I did a video on why people have such a strong emotional reaction to it. And I think it's a really good video. And so maybe that one. Plenty of the fans of this show mm. asked for you to come on to the show. So oh, yeah, I that's think true. Like in early episodes so too. I'm hopeful really? that like, people already yeah. know be stoked. So yeah, that's I, incredible. Either way, go check out his YouTube channel. Make sure you subscribe to that and watch the great content he's putting out over there. Uh, and I'm guessing it's uh, Mike from the party as a... Uh, on social media. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. On Instagram, but not on Twitter because it was one character too many. Yeah. So it's Mike from the Pretty Without the A. Great. Yeah. I mean, I have a similar thing with Ryan Bergara over in the Philippines because my, my ad is at Ryan S. Bergara on X and at Ryan Bergara everywhere else. Byron's at Byron A. Moran everywhere else. And you can follow the pod at FYA pod. Uh, across all the socials make sure if you're watching this over at youtube.com slash watch your podcast if you uh, liked it like the video subscribe same thing for audio subscribe rate this bad boy five stars and maybe we'll see you next time hopefully <laughs> I'm, that, made, that made it seem like this like this podcast gonna get canceled immediately it's not um, but uh, matt's like i don't know uh but uh thank you guys for joining and uh hope you guys enjoy your time on the carousel of progress a world-class ride go enjoy your great Big, beautiful oh tomorrow, <laughs> shining at the end of every day. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's a great, yeah, big, yeah, beautiful yeah, tomorrow. I can't do it. I can't Just do it. Just a dream, a dream away. I can't do it. I can't do it. I'll <laughs> see you guys later. <laughs>